everyone. Uh, this is the uh, Committee of Bar Examiners meeting for uh, Friday, March 15th um, at 9 a.m. I'd like to go ahead and um, open the meeting. Uh, go ahead, Devin, can we do a roll call vote? Dr. Bolton? Are we, uh, Robert Brody? Here. Dr. Cow? Here. Alex Chan? Jim Efteen? Oh, sorry, here. Kareem Gangora? Paul Kramer? Here. Larry Kaplan? Alex Lawrence? Here. Esther Lynn? Justice Macy Walla? Here. Bethany Peak? Ashley Silva Guzman? Here. Judge Reyna? Here. Vince Reyes? Here. Alan Yokelson? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you so much, Devin. I'd like to go ahead and start by saying, as noted on the agenda for today's meeting, public comments during the meeting will be limited. Members of the public wishing to comment were encouraged to submit written comments prior to the meeting to ensure that the committee would have time to consider those comments. The committee has re received them and read all the written public comments. We thank you for that. We will try to attempt to call the members of the public in the order that they appear. To facilitate hearing as many members of the public as possible, I encourage you not to repeat points that were made by previous speakers and to allow the committee the time needed to deliberate on the important topics that we'll be discussing today we will be limiting the public comments to three minutes per person. For those of you who are participating via Zoom video, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It's a hand icon and should appear at the bottom center of your screen. If you wish to make a public comment, please click on that. For those of you who are participating by phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing the star nine. That's the star key, then the number nine. The coordinator will call members of the public in the order that they identify raised hands and will enable the microphones of the speakers. Um, Devin, are there any members of the public that wish to make comment? Yes, there are. Um, our first public comment will be from Benjamin Cohn. Hello, good morning. I wanted to first speak about uh, the training from Dr. Levitt that is special set. Dr. Levitt, I think a few years ago, was last brought in for a similar training. And at that time, he had made a few points that I wanted to, uh, to flag for you. The most uh, concerning being that it, it should not primarily be, in his opinion, the treating doctors who are relied on for a lot of the determinations as to testing accommodations. Uh, that's really not a policy choice that you have available to you. Even if you agree with Dr. Levitt's position on that, the regulations say specifically that it is the treating doctors who need to be given the most deference. Uh, secondarily, he made uh, some other points about uh, the importance of the history of accommodations, but there are a lot of reasons why that is not, not necessarily reflective of disability impairments, including evolutions of medical conditions, access to uh, diagno proper diagnostics, much, many of which are not covered by insurance and such. Uh, I'll note that Dr. Lovett does seem to be a favorite of testing entities who want cover to deny accommodations as a consultant, and I'd encourage you to diversify who you bring into do these trainings, I might suggest Dr. Peter Maduro as a, someone who has both psychologist and law background uh, as an inactive licensed attorney. He might be able to uh, be a consultant for the, for these kind of things. Uh, then I also wanted to compliment the proposals that were brought now on the cost reduction initiatives, these ones are much better, specifically getting rid of the NCBE and doing the multiple choice questions in-house, allowing you to do, allow applicants dual modalities based on which works for them of in-person or remote. I think that, and then the remote uh, 
would be much better. And uh, as long as it's offered to all applicants with testing accommodations, which the dual camera methodology should help to facilitate. Uh, I'll note that you have a new psychometrician uh, saying that that would be valid for the scaling, which I think is correct. And I think it does illustrate the benefits of having a psychometrician that maybe doesn't have a conflict of interest. The prior one was also employed by the NCBE and said that the NCBE's uh, product was essential and irreplaceable. And now you have one who's not uh, working for both of you, who's saying that the independent uh, in-house uh, multiple choice questions would work for scaling. So that's the benefit of that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next public comment is from Todd Hill. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Todd Hill. My comments concern the critical issue of oversight in legal education, specifically regarding the distinction or lack thereof, between JD programs aimed at licensure and non-JD or executive JD programs. This gap of regularity, clarity, not only undermines the state bar's duty to ensure high standards across all legal education, but also affects access and fairness for students navigating their legal careers. The current approach, notably the policy of acquiescence, essentially sidelines or abrogates the committee's responsibility to actively oversee a broad spectrum of legal education. This inaction risks consumer protection and compromises the integrity of our legal profession. Students deserve to know the value and recognition of their degrees in clear terms, especially when they make significant investments in their education and future. I urge the committee to consider reforms that include a comprehensive review and classification of all legal education programs. Such reforms should aim to ensure that every program under the state bar's oversight equips its graduates with the knowledge and skill necessary for the diverse roles they will play in our legal ecosystem. I advocate for a more transparent, accountable, and inclusive regulatory framework that not only upholds the highest standards of legal education, but also reflects fairness and access for all aspiring legal professionals. The inconsistent oversight has left many students navigating a murky landscape where the value and legitimacy of their education can be questioned, impacting their career prospects and financial stability. Furthermore, this regulatory ambiguity undermines the trust in our legal system as the quality and preparedness of those entering the legal profession can vary significantly. The public injury manifests in the dilution of legal services quality as graduates from inadequately overseen programs may not be fully equipped to serve their clients or in my case, even graduate. The situation compromises consumer protection and erodes public confidence in the legal profession at large. I strongly urge the committee to undertake a rigorous review and reformation of the oversight mechanisms it is imperative that we establish a clear, equitable, and comprehensive regulatory framework that ensures all legal education programs meet the high standards necessary for serving the public effectively and honorably. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Our next public comment is from Katie Morin. All right, good morning to the committee and thank you for all members of the public that are here. I'm here today to express my deep concern regarding the recent proposal of the California Bar to cut costs by writing their own multiple choice questions on the 2025 California Bar examination. I really appreciate the need to manage expenses, but I truly believe this proposal raises three critical issues for our consideration here. The first is insufficient notice to current students. So the proposed change would significantly impact students currently on their way to becoming attorneys. I have students I'm working with now who are graduating in 2024, who are already practicing NCBE style multiple choice questions to prepare to do a good job on the California bar exam in February of 2025. Students situated like that one would face an unexpected shift in what to expect on the examination, on how exactly to practice to make sure they're doing what they need to to pass the bar exam on their first attempt. So we have to give adequate notice to allow students like them to prepare effectively and adjust their study schedules and techniques. Without proper lead time, we're gonna disadvantage individuals who have prepared for the existing format. The second is the effectiveness and fairness of bar written questions. So as you all know, in the work you're doing on the Blue Ribbon Committee, the heart of any examination lies in the effectiveness of its questions. And the California bar exam is a rigorous test 
and it determines an individual's eligibility to practice law. The current multiple choice questions are carefully crafted and refined over time. And while we all agree there are flaws with them, ways to improve them, and different directions California wants to take starting in potentially 2026, at least they undergo rigorous review and ensure they can accurately assess the legal knowledge and critical thinking skills of examinees. So introducing these new multiple choice questions without evidence of their effectiveness and fairness could compromise the integrity of our examination process. And third and finally, this is happening at a time where the bar is doing a simultaneous overhaul of the examination. And we're, we're grappling with a broader transformation, the creation of our own completely new exam. So as we seek to adapt to the evolving legal landscape, we have to tread carefully, rushing into changes without consideration or consensus on how it can be tested or done fairly, risks undermining the very purpose of the exam, which is to assess the competence and protect our public. So thank you for your time. I really encourage all of you to reconsider this proposal to, to prioritize transparency and fairness in the well-being of our future legal professionals. And if cost-cutting measures are necessary, which I understand they are, I encourage us to explore alternatives that don't compromise the quality and integrity of the examination process. Thank you. Thank you. We do not, um, someone just raised their hand. Uh, our next public comment will be from Ray Hayden. All right, Ray Hayden here. Can you hear me all right? We can, thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have the two minutes or the three minutes? Three minutes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the admissions function of the California Bar must be self-funding. Currently, it is not. Even with the massive 26 and 32% fee increases, the cost of physical uh, testing locations and staff practice required, and despite the fee increases and cost-cutting actions, admissions is beyond broke. Multiple choice questions are used by the Federal Aviation Administration and all uh, for all of the professional aviation positions. The medical profession uses them in step one, step two CK, and the two day step three exams. The FAA and step exams also include additional information, images, charts, graphs, and the MCQs if required to aid in answering the question. All of these exams have very high pass rates. The step exams for medicine uh, exams have a better than 90% pass rate across all of their exams for first time takers. Uh, CalBar contacted me to discuss my suggestions for the future of the California Bar Exam in June 2023. Uh, shortly thereafter, CalBar followed up with the process of removing the written section of the first year law student's exam due to it being a poor indicator of success on the California Bar Exam. This was part of my suggestion. Lose the written, evolve the MCQs to be objective and fair. Currently, while they might be objective, they are woefully short of being fair. I have fine detailed evidence it's in the instructions alone for the first year law student's exam, multiple choice questions. California general bar exam must be both objective and fair. The exam that I suggest includes no substantial modification of the training and preparation for the passage of the examination, meaning that no notice of the change to that two-year rule for the schools would ever be required. Schools can do whatever they want to do now or evolve their programs to be what the profession of law needs. But there is no two-year delay required with any of my suggestions for the California bar exam. The goal of the exam must be threefold to assure a uh, more competent base of newly licensed lawyers, guarantee better protection for the general public, and guarantee a more diverse California bar membership. All of my suggestions do exactly that and better. The in-person exam, uh, uh, in exam cannot continue due to the costs. The half and half exam, half in person, half remote, uh, boosts the cost tremendously to the people who have to travel to California like myself. And while I might be able to afford it, most people really can't without going uh, into more of what I call terminal student loan debt. It's, it's unbelievable. The uh, exam must be given 100% remotely. Now the exam could be presented in the portal that we use now, meaning we have to sign in to do it. Done right, it could be done on demand. California could indeed be the leader in all of this. Uh, the savings, in the executive summary, the savings are happily understated by many millions of dollars. The initial savings are uh, delightfully substantial, but the future savings are far more than the millions and millions of dollars saved up front and reduced expenses and costs. In fact, the savings are so substantial that the bar exam could be offered a very low cost to examinees due to the massive savings to Cal Bar over the years. I'd need much more time to explain all of that, and I can. It's very, very simple, folks. Multiple choice questions, remote exam, done uh, with multiple choice questions in one single day. And it could be far uh, better than it is now. Thank you very much. Thank you.
We do not have any additional public comments. I'd, I'd like to open up any public comments here uh, in the LA office. None, no public comments. Um, uh, Paul and Vince, are there any public comments in the San Francisco office? No public, no signups, no, nada. Okay, thank you. All right, um, moving on from public comments, we'll go to uh, agenda item um, number one, the uh, the approval of the January 26, 2024 Committee of Bar Examiners public meeting minutes. Um, are there any uh, are there any questions about the uh, the minutes from our last meeting? This is Justice Macy Walla. Um, in the body of the minutes, my first name is spelt wrong, and I would kindly ask that it be corrected. So where it lists the members, my name is spelled correctly, but in the body when it, I talk at different times, my first name is spelled wrong. So that was the only correction I would ask for. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Devin, if we can make that edit for all future meetings as well too, that yes. we spell the justice first name correctly. Um, may we get a, we get a motion to approve the uh, the minutes for the January 26 CB meeting. This is Ravi. I'll approve the minutes with that correction to the judge's name, of course. Thank you, Ravi. May we get a second? I'll second. This is Justice Maciewala. Thank you so much, Justice Maciewala. Um, is there any uh, further discussion about approving the minutes from anyone? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Devin, can we get a roll call vote? Dr. Bolton. <laughs> Dr. Bolton? Robert Brody? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efteen? Kareem Gangora? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex <clears throat> Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Justice Macy Walla? Yes. Bethany Peak? Yes. Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Judge Reyna? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Alan Yokelson? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. With 13 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. <clears throat> Thank you, Devin. Moving on to the chair's report, I just wanted to note today that we have um, two special sessions. The first special session, the, the first special set is for 10 a.m., and that's the training for sub subject matters expert on substantive issues concerning evaluating a test accommodation request. And then we have a second, a second special set at 1 p.m., which is review and approval of standard setting for the first year law students examination. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that as well as for the public, most likely, depending how the schedule goes, we'll probably be taking lunch at around noon today. Um, so that um, that's the tentative uh, agenda uh, for that. Now, I'd like to um, go ahead and if it's OK, if everyone move to the director's report, uh, because we have the special the, set. Do you want to do the consent item? And sure. Then, yeah, we can just we go can do that. that. Okay, so we'll move to agenda item number two, which is the uh, consent agenda. This is uh, the report on administrative updates regarding law schools. I uh, just want to remind everyone and the public that the consent calendar is voted on and approved as an omnibus item, meaning one vote for the entire calendar, unless a board member decides to pull something off the consent calendar. Uh, is there, um, are there any questions about the uh, consent agenda? Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to note one, uh, what I'll call a very amusing thing. Uh, there was a discussion about the ABA schools, some of them using a new substitute for the, um, uh, for the LSAT. And what I thought was really amusing and weird about it was it included an essay component, but it wasn't graded. I don't know if staff knows anything about that. Um, why the why, but that just seems weird to me. Uh, my only guess is that maybe the schools then have to read the essays and decide for themselves if the person, you know, is, is meeting their entry requirements. Uh, other than that, um, I'm willing to move the approval of the consent item. 
uh, according right. to the motion that's contained in the report. Yeah. Okay. So, so Paul, to address your question, it's it's a different format. It's basically a class and then um, associated with the class is an exam. So it's a different way of evaluating students when they come in. Um, and so I, I don't know the specific purpose, uh, but I can find out and get back to you. Yeah, it just seems odd to me that so many things do these days. <laughs> right. Uh, is there any other uh board member that would like to... Uh, I'll second it, Mr. Chair. This is Kareem Gangora. Thank you so much, Kareem, for the second. Uh, is there any other further uh, discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, Devin, may we get a roll call vote? Dr. Bolton? Robert Brody? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efteen? Kareem Gangora? Yes. Paul Kramer? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Justice Macy Walla? Yes. Bethany Peak? Yes. Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Judge Reyna? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Alan Yokelson? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. With 13 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Thank you so much, Devin. Um, so if it's okay with you, Audrey, can we move to the uh, report from the director? Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and hopefully everyone noticed uh, from CBE member feedback, we listed it all out on the agenda this time as well. All right, everyone can see the slides now. Okay, um, Amy's gonna start us off with a little recap from the February bar exam. All right, good morning, everyone. So um, as you can see here, we had a total number of 4,767 applicants that uh, uh, approved, were approved for the exam and 4,319 that attended. So it leaves about 432 that did not show up and then another 16 applicants that uh, partially finished the exam. And uh, that means that they are not counted as having completed the exam. So um, in response to the public comments that we received, uh, I want to share an update about the Cal Palace testing site in Daly City. Uh, the state bar received multiple complaints about the temperature at the Cal Palace during this past administration. And for a little context, I'm going to let you know that at the Cal Palace site, there were two uh, separate halls, uh, large halls that uh, held uh, applicants, a North Hall and a South Hall. So on day one of the exam, approximately 30 applicants in one wing in the South Hall reported feeling too warm uh, around 8 a.m. before the exam started. Uh, staff and facility management responded by turning off the heat in the South Hall. However, in the North Hall, a few applicants said they were cold and the heat uh, came back on and stayed on throughout day one. Um, applicants reported feeling much warmer by the end of the day uh, of the morning uh, of it, the end of the morning session on the first day. Uh, on day two of the exam, both halls did not have reported complaints about the temp temperature either being too hot or too cold. Uh, where we're at, we are currently assessing the situation to determine whether there are any whether any psychometric measures are warranted. However, we're challenged by a variety of factors. Um, first, that feeling cold or hot is uh, subjective. Uh, what some applicants consider too hot or too cold uh, differs from one individual to the next. So uh, that makes this uh, investigation a little challenging. Also, and this is very important, is that we advise applicants prior to the exam um, to be prepared for shifting, uh, shifting temperatures, um, especially in large uh, testing sites. And we prepare them uh, through our information that we share. It's uh, incorporated in the admittance ticket bulletin. So uh, we uh, alert uh, applicants about this uh, scenario uh, from uh, at every exam administration. So as I mentioned, what we're doing is we're assessing the situation and conferring with our psychometrician. 
And should the state bar determine that a grading adjustment is warranted, uh, affected applicants will be notified. Are there any questions related to- Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Amy, this is Alan. Um, just a general question. When we do get complaints like this from applicants, um, do we acknowledge it in any way, just respond saying we got the complaint and we're looking into it or anything like that? Yes, we do that with um, all, of, all of the complaints that we receive after every exam. Thank you. Sure. All right, Ashley. Hi. Um, so I actually had um, a number of students reach out to me directly about the issues both at Cal Palace and at the Ontario site. Um, mostly for the Ontario side, if I'm remembering correctly, was the was the temperature as well. But I think what was also particularly concerning about the Cal Palace site was that I had heard from a couple students that their the heaters were putting off pretty significant gas smells. Um, that was that I think is also something we should look into as we're kind of doing this investigation into kind of the heating methods and what was being provided for students when we do ask, you know, or when they do ask for um, us to, you know, kind of up the heat or or lower the heat. Um, I, I think if my understanding is correct, and maybe I'm wrong, but we're not using the Cal Palace again, are we? Or are we? Okay. We are not. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, I think for future, you know, if we do consider another location that um, that we aren't, I guess, familiar with as much, um, we obviously, I believe we talked about how we looked into this, we screened the site and everything like that, but um, more lessons to be learned about how we can't anticipate everything. Um, and I think that that is something that um, really goes into um, listening to our public comments and trying to really, and I, I think, um push our students to come to us when there's issues um so i think wanted to flag that um and then also wanted to um flag that at the pasadena site which i visited and i think also robbie visited as well um they did amazing so i i was able to visit that site and whatever we did there we need to i think just replicate at all the other sites because um they were very organized. They had everyone checked in. They said that there were no stragglers. They had everyone checked in by time of test. Um, and I think that that's kind of something we should emulate in the future with any new test sites or even our current test sites if we're continuing in Ontario, which also seemed to have some issues. Well, um, thank you, Ashley. Um, and the gas smell is um, absolutely a new topic. I had never heard, we haven't received um, a complaint here in the office about gas smells related to the um, Heat, heating system, um, but uh, we'll add that to the list in terms of things to um, look for. And also, I just want to clarify that the Cal Palace is not, it, this is not the first time that we use a Cal Palace. We've used it in the past. Uh, obviously, it's been a while since we were at that testing location. And so, um, you know, we, we don't plan on using it um, in the future. Um, but uh, in terms of um, our uh, ability to set up and um, and plan um, and execute um, the the location itself is not new. It was not new to us. Um, and in terms of you know our setup at all locations, we have a very uh, clear methodology in terms of our staffing structure, how we set up, when we set up from one location to the next. So uh, it's very easy as for uh, for us to um, uh, really replicate like uh, what you saw in Ontario. It, it's I can guarantee that it's the same approach that we had at each of our testing sites. Um, but like you said, some things are out of our control. We always highlight, it's what we highlight in our admittance ticket bulletin, that we make every effort to make the environment as uh, comfortable as possible. But the things like sound, uh, we uh, encourage people to bring uh, earplugs. Uh, temperature, we bring out, uh, request people to uh, advise people that they may fluctuate, that they should bring uh, sweaters, whatever the case, uh, or to dress in layers. So um, again, I, we're still investigating it, but I, I just want to assure you that um, we we have a, we attempt a consistent approach at every single one of our testing sites. And that that actually brings up another question. So, uh, did we have these similar issues when we brought when we? tested previously at the Cow Palace. I assume it was a pretty significant time period ago. Um, 
but I don't know. I, I um, no, we didn't have these reports back then. Gotcha. Um, I, I think uh, part of it is that, uh, you know, this is could be a facility that ha is not used that often. And so um, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the systems like um, are a little different or outdated. Uh, but it's definitely something that we factored in and uh, and why we just have decided not to go back to that location. Yeah, I think it's also the difference of time of, you know, timing in the year, because if we used them in July, then that would obviously be different oh. than February, too. Oh, yeah, we've used them for both February and July. Gotcha. Yeah. OK, thank okay. you. I just want to say, um, Ashley, just say I can see a lot of our staff in the attendee pool that the staff that worked at the Cow Palace uh, ran that site extremely well, was very on time. So I know you went to Pasadena. <clears throat> When, you know, there were issues at the Cow Palace, maybe with the too hot or too cold, but our staff did a wonderful job working that site. Yeah, I don't think the staff could do much about about temperature, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they I guess we can, we're obviously looking into it, but I'm sure the staff did as good as they can. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's a huge, huge site. So managing everything is probably close to impossible to do perfectly. Thanks. All right, we're gonna move to the next slide. On to the next exam. Let's see, yes. um, Amy. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we opened the application on March 1st. Uh, we did have a technical issue that allowed some applicants to apply early on February 29th, and that was resolved uh, the following day. Uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, these are our different July test sites. We have seven testing locations in Southern California and three in Northern California. Uh, we're working on a fourth um, in Northern California. Um, and uh, as of last night, uh, we have already 5,131 applicants that have submitted applications uh, and uh, for that exam. So this submission uh, means they've applied and uh, paid. And so now we, um, we anticipate um, our large pool uh, that we typically have for July administration. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Well, I think this is Tara. Um, wait, before we leave this um, this this uh, topic, I, I just want to say, you know, as I always do, I, I also I followed Ashley and visited the Pasadena Center, and you know, Audrey and Amy make it seem like this is very easy, and we do this all the time, and it, actually, it is not easy. It is very, very difficult, and the staff, certainly at the site that I saw, went above and beyond, as they always do. It was, I, I couldn't agree more with Ashley. It was, it was very together. You know, I knew everyone there from visiting previously, but really, the, 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 to get this going for that many applicants, almost 5,000, is really something. And I want to give a, an extra shout out today to Amy. You know, we had a, a staff change recently, and I know Amy has now got even more on her plate, including summarizing uh, these exams. And uh, Amy, you always go above and beyond for this kind of stuff. And uh, everybody in the CBE is very appreciative of that. So thank you. Um, thank you, um, uh, Robbie. Uh, but I'm not alone on this. Um, there is <laughs> there are a lot of people working on this. Um, so thank you. And thank you, Robbie, for visiting and Ashley for visiting. It means a lot to the staff to see CBE members there. Um, so thank you for going out to the site. Right. Yeah. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is just a quick update on the rules revision since our January meeting. Uh, if you may recall, the testing accommodations and the examinations rule were approved by the board end of last year, so they're still waiting transmission and review by the court. Um, the moral character rules will be going to the board next week um, with a request out for public comment. And you might notice that all of the other rules that we had on the plan um, when we brought this in January are no longer here. The reason being is that the state bar is actually hiring a, an internal rules attorney. So that way our submissions to the court are more consistent and streamlined. Okay. And any questions? Thank you. Um, Cody. 
Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to give a quick update on um, an item we, uh, the committee discussed at the January mid meeting and uh, that we will be continuing to discuss at the April meeting, but just filling in the gaps of what's happened since then. Uh, so just as a quick recap, um, we talked about initiatives to improve outcomes for unaccredited law schools. And at the January meeting, staff presented the law school profile report, which was the first to cover all of the different types of law schools here in California. And we focus in on challenges and opportunities at unaccredited law schools, including smaller but more diverse student bodies alongside low JD conferral bar exam pass rates and, and high attrition. And we had a really uh, productive conversation. The committee discussed potential initiatives to improve outcomes such as minimum exam pass rates and mandatory accreditation pathways. Um, and I thought it was particularly um, promising that members really identified the value of bringing forth um, data to help uh, shape our discussions. Um, so we, since then, um, have been engaging the members of the committee that had volunteered to work with staff in exploring these initiatives. Thank you, Paul Kramer and Alan Yokelson for collaborating on that. Um, and it was our goal to narrow in on some options ahead of the April committee meeting. So at this next meeting, um, staff will be presenting even more data to help inform the committee's decision-making around these initiatives. Uh, we had a CS bars meeting earlier this week, and those members provided input on how to add additional layers of nuance and context to the data. We will explore where that is possible. Um, along with uh, the additional data, we will be sharing input from that CS bars meeting, as well as uh, a meeting today with the Council for Access and Fairness. They are re reviewing the law school profile report and these initiatives. Uh, and we will be sharing feedback from both of those meetings to inform uh, the discussion at the April meeting as well. And then the next slide, please. Oh, I just, were there any questions? Oh yeah, any questions on that? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, another update related to um, the fees proposal for California accredited law schools. Um, a proposal was presented to the board in September uh, for the adoption of uh, fees that would eliminate the difference between our current revenue and the expenditures related to accreditation services for these schools. Um, at the time, the board directed staff to lower the amount, uh, the proposed amount to be assessed. Um, and staff are going to recommend at the next uh, board meeting, which is next week, a fee structure that would yield about one third of the original proposal. I wanted to share with the committee today that staff met with deans from the California accredited law schools um, after receiving a letter identifying some issue areas that we felt warranted exploration, although we did not necessarily agree with all the points made. Those discussions were very productive and next week's proposal um, to the board includes some of the recommendations made at these meetings. And I just wanna flag some of the recommendations that we, that we expect to be in this um, item. So first, uh, changes to the what is called the annual report fee. The annual report fee is intended to cover all of the services related to accreditation for these schools. Uh, but because of the name, the annual report fee name, uh, there is the likelihood of confusion. Uh, so staff are going to recommend changing uh, the reference to the fee in the schedule of charges and deadlines to the accreditation services fee. Um, along with that, the state bar has long subsidized the law schools by assessing fees that are si significantly below state bar cost. So staff are going to recommend adopting uh, what is a, an approach that the CALS preferred, which is assessing uh, the fee owed by each school based on enrollment numbers. Um, and we are actually working with the schools to identify the best methodology for doing so. Um, and last, another update uh, related to the inspection fee. Uh, for those of you on the committee that are familiar with the inspection process, um, the fee that currently exists uh, is essentially broken down into five prepayments. So schools pay a prepayment, one fifth of the total cost of the inspection fee every year for five years ahead of their inspection. 
and at the um, uh, preference of the schools themselves, we will be proposing that schools submit one full payment, um, a minimum of th 30 days prior to the scheduled inspection. And there are another uh, few small other details and updates that will be included in the item posted on the board's agenda ahead of next week's meeting. Cody, I think and, there's a hand raised in the SF office. Yes. Yeah, um, so Cody, even with the fees, as you said, the fees you're proposing next week will not, you said they'll cover a third of the actual costs of the services, is that right? Well, the initial proposal covered the full cost of those services and what is being proposed this week is one third of that initial proposal. So essentially, yes. So where where is the money to make that deficit up gonna come from? Uh, I think we'll learn later that we're not currently charging the full cost of the exams. Um, so what is this cash cow that's making balancing the budget possible? Uh, well, I don't think uh, this item really contemplates what will be needed to close that gap. Um, so I, I'm sure there'll be further discussions about other initiatives that are required. It does, the item I think does, uh, a staff intend to include in the item, uh, at least an acknowledgement that this recommended fee, um, it, it could be uh, for the short term, it's not necessarily a permanent solution, um, but but it does the item does not fully explore what else would be required. So, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask you to ask staff to bring back at our next meeting, which will be after the board acts on the fees, what the projections are for the admissions budget over the next um, couple of years. Uh, so that can be shared with us um, to alleviate any concerns. It's as an informational item, not for us to pick at it, but as I have said so many times before, uh, we make decisions to the extent we're still asked to make them, um, and we should be mindful of the effects on the budget when we do that. And the only way to do that is to have that information. Thank you, Paul, for bringing that up. Um, Audrey, is that something that uh, we can bring back as an informational item for our next meeting? Yeah, well, I think what might make sense is, well, members can look at the February board meetings. Um, the board of trustees at their February meeting had the budget approved there. And it, it did talk about uh, the admissions budget in that item and our ongoing structural deficit, which is why we're discussing the bar exam uh, cost today. So you can look at that item. And then what we can do is also see if Araceli, the CFO will come and give a, a high level overview for the CBE in, in April. Yeah, I think uh, we shouldn't have to go looking for that. Oh no, I'm just saying in the interim, it is it's posted and publicly available on yeah. that um on that February yeah. board item in it the interim. Change right? a little bit because of the decisions to be made next week, right? Yes. So, so the what it it's absent that um the Cal's piece that Cody was just discussing. Okay. Thank you, Audrey. That would be great if possible. If uh, if someone could give us a high level overview, if possible, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, the last slide I had was just a reminder that our next meeting, so it doesn't, I don't think I need to share that slide, but it's uh, the next meeting is another remote meeting on April 19th. Um, in case everyone needs a reminder, the next in-person meeting is August 16th in Los Angeles. We are working again to get a room block and trying to coordinate everything ahead of time. So um, that meeting runs smoothly in person. Were there any questions on any of the um, slides shared today in the director's report? Okay. Okay, look, go ahead, Larry. The next meeting was uh, after the one in April was August. No, no, no. The, uh, Audrey, could you go over the schedule again? Larry, Larry just wanted a clarification. I'm so oh. sorry. Yeah, so we do have another meeting between April and August and June, but that one's not going to be uh, in person. That meeting is going to be remote as well. Um, I'm just reminding you that the next in-person meeting is uh, August 16th, and that's going to be in Los Angeles. The June meeting is June 21st. So we have a meeting April 19th that's going to be remote like this. June 21st, that's going to be remote. And then August 16th, we'll be in person in Los Angeles. 
Is, is that okay, Larry? Yeah, they roll the same to me because I got to come here. Okay. okay. But, all right. <laughs> Larry, Larry uh, understands that better. Thank you so much, Audrey. Okay, okay. no worries. All right. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions for our director or any of our other directors? Okay, seeing none. Um, so the schedule, like I said today, we have a, a 10 a.m. special set um, and a special set at 1 p.m. And then we, you know, I anticipate a, a, a discussion uh, on the update, which will update on cost reduction. So it, it is a little early, but may I see if it's okay we take a, uh, maybe like a, 10 minute break or something like this right now while we wait for 10 a.m. special set, Audrey, or what do you suggest? Oh, that's that's fine with me if it's fine with the members. Yeah, is that is that okay for everyone? Okay, I see a thumbs up from our justice. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll we'll reconvene uh in a, in about uh 10 minutes then. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, All right. Oh, donut. look. Thank you for the donuts. Up at the speaker. Yes, yes. Look at his library. <sighs> excellent, excellent. Look at all those books. All right. It's a fake so, background. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. You're, That's, you're, <laughs> you're so well read. Gee whiz. Is, is that a real background or is that like a, a Zoom background? <laughs> it, that it is, I promise. It's a, that is impressive. <laughs> can I have a background like that? Can I see you pull, pull you see one of those books from, from the shelf? Just to see sure. If it's real. Okay. Nice. Uh, look, he's going to prove it. You're going to prove it? Wow. Wow. Oh, my, wow. <laughs> you picked the book. Is it a coincidence you picked a book written by you? Uh, no, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, <laughs> only some of the books came with the office. But I, I appreciate it. I thought it was a little humble brag. So, um, I have a couple of them back there, but okay, okay. We 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 are impressed, Doctor Lovin. We're ready to listen now because we know that those books are real. <laughs> After the background, it's hard to live up to these expectations. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> All right, okay, Audrey. So, um, are we able to start the special set now? It's 10 a.m. So I will go ahead and introduce that. Uh, we're moving on to uh, agenda item um, number four, uh, which is training from subject matter expert on substantive issues concerning evaluating testing accommodations requests. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Christina, if that's okay with you, Christina. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to give a short introduction to Dr. Benjamin Levitt, who is here with us today. He is a associate professor of psychology and education at Teachers College at Columbia University, where he also directs the PhD program in school psychology. He teaches classes on psychological assessment and on the legal and ethical basis for school psychology practice. His research interests concern three areas, the diagnostic assessment of learning and attention problems, the effects of testing accommodations and the nature and management of test anxiety. He has over a hundred publications on these and related topics, including the book entitled Testing Accommodations for Students with Disabilities, a Research-Based Practice. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lovett for being here today. I am gonna turn it over to you. Oh, thanks so much for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to address this body, I believe, back in 2020 at the start of the pandemic in June. Um, so I was looking back at my calendar and things like that. It's great to be back in, in better times, I think, with regard to that. So I'm going to share my screen now with the presentation and get started. <laughs> Okay, let's see. So I've called this Disability Diagnosis and Accommodations Provision, a review of recent research. And even though I've tried to leave some time at the end for questions, I would really encourage committee members to stop me at any time with questions. I always wanna make sure that I can clarify things and even go in directions that you would all find helpful in terms of information that's particularly pertinent, things that you would like to know. So let's see. So when I was looking back at my presentation from 2020, I was actually surprised at how much we have learned even since then. Even though the overall framework for accommodations provision is the same in many ways, uh, we actually know some information we didn't. So I'm gonna be focusing in part on new research in areas that you see listed here information on the prevalence of accommodations. And I'm actually gonna talk about accommodations at the K-12 level, because eventually you see a lot of those folks later in their life. Uh, I'll be talking about equity issues and accommodations. I don't think it will surprise anyone that over the past four or five years, there's been a lot of interest and work on that. And a lot of it should have probably happened earlier, but it's finally getting done. Uh, we have more information on what we call symptom base rates. And what that means is how common are certain symptoms in the general population? If someone reports being easily distracted, for instance, is that a sign of a disability or is that more likely to be a typical feature of what most people experience? I'll also talk about the utility of diagnostic testing when we're making accommodations decisions. How much should we rely on scores from psychoeducational assessments? And then finally, I'll talk about the accommodation of anxiety. Uh, we actually have a number of recent studies on that topic. 
So again, feel free to stop me at any point if there are questions, and I'm always very happy to also go into more detail on any of the points I'm discussing. So I'll open by talking about work on the prevalence of accommodations. This is a study that came out in 2020, and it looked at reports that are written by folks in my profession, school psychologists. So in most states, including yours and mine, in California and New York, school psychologists are often the heads of special education teams for the purpose of psychoeducational assessment when we're identifying children and adolescents as having disability conditions that qualify for special education, and for accommodations. And so these researchers, Matt Burns and his colleagues, looked at 130 school psychologist reports from a number of different school districts and actually recorded all of the recommendations that school psychologists made. We know that special education teams often listen to the school psychologist as an expert. I'll come back to this slide, but just to show you, this is actually a table from their article. Uh, sometimes there are no recommendations because the psychologist leaves that to be a team decision. But the most common recommendation when there were any was extra time for tests and assignments. The second most common recommendation was breaking tasks into smaller units. And the third was preferential seating. Children with ADHD or other sorts of problems like that are often seated next to the teacher. So Matt Burns and his colleagues noted that accommodations were the most common things that were recommended for students with disabilities. Accommodations as opposed to interventions. Even for younger children, there's a recent tendency to accommodate any sort of impairment as opposed to think about what we can do to remediate that using an evidence-based intervention. So again, higher levels of accommodation use at younger ages are going to lead to continued accommodation requests later as these children become adolescents, become young adults, and eventually some of them are, of course, uh, sitting for the bar. So that was a study. I'm sorry. Yes, please. I see a hand up. Yeah. Um, in the context of a bar exam, what would it can you think of something that would be in the category of an intervention? I'm not saying that we should yeah. go that route. I'm just trying to conceptualize it. Absolutely. So I don't think of testing agencies as having a responsibility for recommending or certainly implementing interventions. Um, there are, however, interventions that folks can on their own use for problems like anxiety or even issues related to, say, a reading disability. So some of those interventions can be used regardless of the age. So even though at younger ages, I think there should be even more emphasis on interventions um, and intervention availability is certainly not a good reason to deny accommodations to folks who are substantially limited. So I certainly wouldn't recommend or advocate that. But being aware of evidence-based interventions is still, I think, helpful at all ages and all settings. To take a quick example, if someone has an anxiety disorder, a validated, well-documented anxiety disorder, Anxiety is actually one of the psychological problems that shows the greatest treatment efficacy. Cognitive behavioral interventions, especially what we call exposure-based interventions, where someone gets used to a stimulus or an object that causes anxiety, um, is, can be very, very effective at reducing things. So again, not to say that it's the responsibility of testing entities to be promoting or insisting that applicants or candidates use those, but to be aware that they are present, they are available. And so when I see and school teams that are not using interventions, to me, that's a particular problem. Accommodations will often not be necessary if interventions are implemented, particularly early in life. So when I see a second grader who's already getting extra time on tests because they're a slow reader and they're not being given a reading fluency intervention, to me as a school psychologist, that's a real problem. There are things that we can do to at least try to remediate that deficit to increase the speed and fluency with which a child reads. So I hope I've addressed some of, of those things and happy to return or, or speak more. So I'll just talk a little bit more about the prevalence at these younger ages. So this is another study. The first one that I covered was about what school psychologists recommend. This study is about what special education teams actually do. So uh, these researchers looked at uh, accommodations that were being provided to over 200 high school students. So they also looked, we're kind of aging up, we're getting a little bit higher in terms of the age range. And so Kern et al. looked at uh, 222 IEPs, the special education plans of students who are in different categories 
Some of them had SLD, a specific learning disability. Others had EBD, emotional and behavioral disorders. And others had OHI, other health impairments. Folks in special education law will be familiar with those categories. So the vast majority of these students received accommodations and typically in multiple categories, on average about three different ones. So the vast, vast majority received a timing or scheduling accommodation like extra time or break storing tests or things like that. Um, and you can see smaller numbers for presentation accommodations. That would be something like reading a test to a student, 44% for response accommodations, things like using a calculator, uh, those sorts of things. In contrast, these researchers found that structured behavioral strategies, which are the best interventions for actually remediating problems, were rare on IEPs. So 15% or fewer, depending on the particular behavioral strategy. So to me, this just suggests that accommodations are not only common, but they appear to be our default response at the K-12 level. And so often students are not receiving evidence-based interventions at the time when those interventions would be most helpful. Uh, and if we think about the job of schools as opposed to testing entities, schools are really trying to improve students' skills, improve students' autonomy, promoting those sorts of things. For some types of disability-related impairments, that won't be possible. Uh, for many other types of disability-related impairments, it is, though. So this for folks who are curious is the full table from that study. And you can see just how common different sorts of accommodations are. 35% of students had a calculator use uh, on, on their IEP as an accommodation. Um, you can see the different sorts of extended time. Um, I actually find the prevalence of these accommodations to be pretty similar in terms of their rank order to what we see on uh, standardized tests. So we see extended time, we see small group presentation of tests is another thing that's common. Um, and then uh, read aloud is also up there. Uh, for adults, that would often be a text-to-speech assistive technology, some accommodation like that. So that was just, I think, helpful background to see how common these are. I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about testing accommodations in general, to have a clear definition and a clear purpose, why we have accommodations in the first place. I know all of you are, are used to spending a lot of time on this, but taking a step back and reflecting, I think, can lead to a helpful understanding. So I think of accommodations and my own definition is as changes in the way that we administer a test while keeping the content of the test the same. So in K-12, students who have extremely severe disabilities, they may actually take a different sort of assessment entirely. That's not an accommodation. We want students who receive accommodations and at the adult level, examinees who receive accommodations to have the same test. It's just being administered in a somewhat different format or a different way. And the purpose is to remove or reduce the impact of a disability. The goal, of course, in the law is to have improved test access. Um, tests are part of the uh, opportunities in life. And so having appropriate, fair access is what we care about. And that, in turn, leads to higher test score validity. So to really flesh this out and see what that means in terms of examples, I'm going to provide a couple of model cases of accommodations. It's often easiest to see this, I think, with sensory and physical disability-related impairments. So if you're assessing an examinee, a candidate who is blind, for instance, then an appropriate technique might be an audio recording of test items or for an increasingly few number of, of examinees, a braille format or something like that. Um, for students who have low vision, it might just be enlarged print. For students who have a motor impairment and use a wheelchair, they might just need the desk adjusted. Or you might allow someone who has fine motor impairments to uh, dictate their answers instead. And so what makes these mo cases model cases, what makes them really easy for folks to understand, are the three factors that you see at the bottom. So first, these examinees have really obvious impairments. There's not a lot of controversy over whether blindness would constitute a disability, whether someone would be substantially limited. Relatedly, the individuals here have clearly unusual access needs. No one would suggest that an examinee with these problems just try taking the test in the typical format. It would be obviously unethical. And then finally, the accommodations that you see here are not widely desired and certainly not by non-disabled candidates. People are not seeking a braille format of a test, of course, unless they typically have a disability and they're certainly able to read in braille. So these are model cases. They help to make the case for why accommodations are so important. Accommodations are also important for other sorts of disability conditions, but I find that those decisions and the cases become a lot harder. 
So I think of these as hard cases of accommodations. And I know how common and unfortunate abbreviations are, but just to, to go through these learning disabilities, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Increasingly, I see autism spectrum disorder as a listed basis for accommodations, traumatic brain injury, and then anxiety. So what distinguishes these sorts of conditions and these sorts of accommodations cases from the model cases earlier? What you see on this slide, these are disorders where the diagnostic criteria are controversial. Different states diagnose learning disabilities in different ways. Clinicians have often a flexible approach to diagnosing learning disabilities. With regard to ADHD, there are so many different ways to, to measure symptoms. Do you rely on someone's self-reports? Do you rely on the reports of third-party informants? Do you look at neuropsychological test scores? Those sorts of things. There's no authority we can go to that says you use exactly these criteria. You use this precise measure, and if you don't, the evaluation doesn't count. So the controversial diagnostic criteria do cause some problems. In addition, it's unclear when the accommodations that are sought for these disabilities are needed as opposed to just preferred because the requested accommodations here are widely desired. Students with and without disabilities report that they would benefit from extra time or breaks or a separate room uh, during tests. And so that's why I think these are harder decisions why we often have to be more careful. So um, as you know, of course, these hard cases are more common than the model cases that I talked about earlier. And that's something that starts in K to 12 and it just grows when we look at standardized tests. So this is the most recent data from uh, a document that's published by the Federal Department of Education every year called the Condition of Education. These are the proportions of students who have IEPs, special education plans. By far the largest category is specific learning disability, and that's been the case for decades now, that that's been the largest category. And again, different states define it in different ways. So, you know, there's an old joke in school psychology, the quickest way to cure a learning disability is by moving. Because if you go to a different state, you go to even a different school district, the definition of the disability may be quite different for learning disabilities. Um, speech and language impairment also up there. Other health impairment, which in many cases refers to ADHD. In many districts, that's really what it is. Autism again. If we look for what those model cases were, things like sensory and physical impairments, we see hearing impairment, 1% of students who have an IEP. Orthopedic impairment, 1%. Vision doesn't even make the list because in relative terms, it's so rare. So most of the cases that we're dealing with when accommod uh, accommodation decisions are first made at the K to 12 level are these hard cases. And that's still the case when we look at adults or when we look at folks who are about to age out of high school. So this is a report from the GAO uh, that folks are familiar with the government agency. They had first done a study like this some years ago and then just did another audit in 2022. So you can see here the percentage of accommodations that this is actually the ones that were requested in 2019 to 2020 on admissions tests. So very similar to what we see, I believe, on a bar exam. You can see, again, almost half were learning disability cases, uh, about a quarter ADHD, then psychiatric, and in relatively smaller numbers for physical or medical related disabilities. Um, still relatively small for ASD, but that number has actually grown a lot. Um, and then sensory, again, very, very small. So most of the cases that we deal with are hard cases in that sense. There's not a clear logical relationship where it's automatic. This disability means that obviously the person needs exactly this accommodation. Instead, the decisions often, often have to be made on an individual basis very carefully. So that's, I think, some helpful prevalence data. Just to talk a little bit more about why we have accommodations in the first place, I don't think, again, this will be uh, odd to anyone, but I think it's helpful to go through in a little bit more detail. I think about accommodations as part of a more general commitment to access as part of concerns that we have about equity to folks, and in particular, social justice, ensuring that people have equal opportunities. So students with disabilities and examinees with disabilities, just like many other marginalized groups, obviously have a lot of historical neglect. Even at the K-12 level, of course, before special education law started federally in the 1970s, it was common for students with disabilities to be excluded entirely from educational opportunities. So we often think of accommodations as a way to, as we often say, level the playing field to ensure that everyone is able to participate. And the goal is to ensure equity and test access. I've put the word access in bold because it's so important. 
And you've probably seen the equity meme that I show a, par a portion of here. You can see three individuals who are watching a, a baseball game. And so they all have access equally to observe the game. That doesn't mean that they're going to enjoy the game. It doesn't mean their team's going to win the game. It's about access. It's about being able to participate in the event of observing the game, watching the game. And the same thing is true of tests. Folks who need equal access in terms of accessing a test, but that doesn't mean that they're going to pass the test, do as well as they would like, enjoy taking the test, be comfortable touring the test necessarily. Those are things that we don't always have control over. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we try to kind of cash out what that really means in terms of equity and access. So I think of accommodations as being a double-edged sword, and that's why the accommodations or decisions are so difficult. When we use accommodations well, we're fulfilling the purpose that I talked about earlier. Accommodations are increasing assessment validity. We're able to make more accurate inferences about a candidate's skills, and they're promoting equity. They're ensuring that people have equal access. Unfortunately, when accommodation decisions are made the wrong way, when they're used poorly, accommodations can actually decrease assessment validity. The information that we get from a test can actually be less or less accurate when we get accommodations used in the wrong way, and that impedes equity. And so even though this is often surprising to people, there are a couple of specific equity-related concerns that I'm going to move into discussing. Um, and I consider these both cases of accommodations misuse. So the first equity-related concern is that accommodations are not always equally available. They themselves are not always equally accessible. And so we sometimes describe this, I'll come back to this slide, but this problem is the rich getting richer. And so the data on this actually first began to come out formally in 2019. So the Wall Street Journal, that newspaper first did an investigative article that was published in May of 2019, looking at who receives 504 accommodations. Some, some of you are familiar with Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Most students who have a Section 504 plan in K-12 uh, or in college, for that matter, only get accommodations, not special education. And you can see in their analysis, they found that the wealth of a school district was a very strong predictor of what proportion of students would have a 504 plan. So this was in May of 2019. A couple months later, the New York Times actually followed up with their own, um, in some ways, more detailed independent evaluation, and they found exactly the same thing, that you could really find this almost linear relationship where as a school became more affluent in terms of the families in that district, you see more and more accommodations used. This was surprising because traditionally, disability has been associated with poverty. A lot of the things that we associate with poverty in terms of lack of resources, lack of healthcare access, those sorts of things, also increase risk for disability. So when these data first came out, they were actually surprising. More recent data since then have continued along the same tack. So a study was published just a couple years ago by Bob Weiss. He's a professor at Denison University and one of his students, he's been looking at accommodations related issues for several years. And we're getting closer to the age where folks are starting to go to law school. Um, Weiss and colleagues found that there was an overall doubling of the proportion of college students with disabilities, registered disabilities with the Disability Services Office or otherwise identifying that way between 2009 and 2020. And so this is a huge change. Now, of course, this could simply be that we're making opportunities that are appropriate for folks with disabilities to now attend college. And so Weiss et al. were really interested in finding out, well, which colleges are showing this growth the most? And so in this article, this is one of the graphs from there, you can see the selectivity of the college are these different lines. The red line at the top are the most selective colleges. And then we have moderate and low selectivity, and then finally open enrollment. So we see that it's the high selectivity colleges, the colleges that are hardest to get into, the most elite colleges that have actually shown by far the most growth. The open enrollment colleges like community colleges and occasionally four-year schools like that have actually shown the least amount of growth. So if we look at who's getting diagnosed, if we look at who's getting accommodations or other sorts of disability related services, it appears to be folks who are at the most elite institutions. The same thing is true when we look at who is receiving them with regard to Pell Grant recipients. Pell Grants are available for low-income students, and so we can see the colleges that are giving out the most disability accommodations are the ones that are giving out the fewest Pell Grants to low-income students. 
So again, we see this relationship. It appears to be more elite institutions that actually have more at least diagnosed disability. There's actually a relationship between those two things, the proportion of students with disabilities and the proportion receiving Pell Grants, and it keeps getting stronger and stronger over time. For folks who are familiar with the correlation coefficient symbolized as R here, the higher that R is, the stronger the relationship is. And so we see that keeps growing stronger and stronger, at least across the time point that Weiss and his student looked at. So just reflecting on this data, I think it should lead us to think about who is getting accommodations. And it may tell us something about how diagnoses are getting made. We know that many students who receive the most high frequency diagnoses of learning disabilities and ADHD have symptoms that have high base rates. They're symptoms that are actually very common in the general population. So students who are honestly reporting that they're easily distracted or that they fidget frequently, or that for instance, they have difficulty sustaining attention to their textbooks as a college student for hours at a time. Those sorts of things are high frequency behaviors. Those are high base rates. Many students with and without disabilities endorse them, but they lead to a diagnosis. We also know that many folks diagnose a learning disability to this day by looking at a discrepancy between a high IQ and a somewhat lower academic skill achievement score. So for instance, a student who has a very, very high IQ, a high IQ that push, puts them in the top 2% of the population, if they only have average reading skills, some psychologists will diagnose them with a learning disability. Because wealth, affluence strongly correlate with IQ, that's going to lead to inequitable amounts of diagnoses being made. And so when we begin to consider what the dynamics are in the diagnostic process, if people go to an evaluator for a diagnosis, and it's not based on any dishonesty, folks are experiencing something like being easily distracted, or again, having trouble sustaining attention to reading or something like that, or honestly feeling like they're a slower reader than the peers who they see, Wealthy folks are obviously going to have the resources to pay for preferred evaluators who are going to work harder to advocate. And we also see in high achieving, high affluence communities, genuinely high perfectionism. Folks who really do expect to be performing at high levels. I think there are some good data actually showing genuinely higher rates of anxiety in these populations. And so that goes with the perfectionism. If someone has high ability, at least in some areas, you think you should be doing well in all areas. You have really high expectations for yourself. You often come from a family of achievers. And so that's going to lead to feeling like there's something wrong with you. You honestly will believe you have a problem. You go to an evaluator who's using discrepancies. They're going to then find a disability. And my own profession of psychologists have, I think, genuinely tried to help by promoting diagnosis. But at times, it can lead to overdiagnosis. I'll show you just as an example, one diagnostician in my area in New York City has just a simple web form you can fill out. This is from this evaluator's website. Do you have an issue that prevents you from finishing your tests on time? Well, you know, most people have an issue in the sense of experiencing admissions tests as being time pressured. Most people would feel that law school exams are time pressured, but you can fill out this form, find out if you're eligible for extra time. So, you know, to be fair and to be generous to this evaluator, I think they're trying to genuinely help people who need it, but it can easily lead to overdiagnosis. And we've seen just in the past few years, more diagnosticians acknowledging that openly. So in a psychology journal a couple of years ago, there was a really interesting openly confessional article by Rob Maypu. Some of you may have even seen evaluations from Dr. Maypu in the past where he's talking about how his own career has changed and how his own attitudes and views have changed as he's watched what's happened to disability over time. So I'll show you just a couple of excerpts from this article. He talks about, for instance, one case of a 15-year-old with ADHD who was earning strong grades without accommodations. The school recognized this as well, but ultimately agreed to the parents' pressured insistence on extra time. This was a very unpleasant position for me as an evaluator, he's saying. And so for the most part, I stopped doing these evaluations. He goes on in my group practice, which I believe is representative of metropolitan areas with a large affluent population. My colleagues and I have seen students feeling increased pressure to make straight A's, regardless of their cognitive abilities, so that they can get into the right college, medical school, law school. Parents often agree and believe their child is not performing up to their potential. 
with a looser definition of disability, more folks are seeking a disability label to explain grades with which they are unhappy and accommodations to improve their grades. And I think the key thing to pay attention to here is that there's no accusation of blame. Everyone is doing what makes sense for them. People honestly believe that they have a problem and they feel a great deal of genuine pressure. It's certainly what I see in high achieving school districts that I've worked with. So all of this fits under that first equity concern that we're giving out accommodations where they're actually least needed. If we use a formal definition of disability that requires substantial limitations in major life activities compared to the average person in the general population. If we really try to stick to that legal standard, we're going to run into a lot of pressure from folks who instead you see described here. The second equity concern actually connects to what I had opened my presentation with about the difference between accommodations and interventions. Students who have genuinely low achievement, even compared to the average person in the general population, appear to increasingly be given accommodations rather than evidence-based interventions. And it's worth thinking about why. So when that starts at the K-12 level, accommodations are quite simply easier, especially for high-need, low-resource school districts. So teachers, students, parents, administrators, all like accommodations. They tend to raise test scores relatively quickly, so that solves the problem, or so it appears. And again, they don't require a lot of resources. Asking a teacher to give students more time or read them the test is easier than providing special education interventions. Interventions are better for school building, but they take a lot more work. Um, when I presented to you all in 2020, we actually didn't have any direct comparisons. And so just after the presentation, it's kind of incredible, in June of 2020, this article was published in the Journal of School Psychology. These researchers, Judy Harrison at Rutgers University and her colleagues, conducted the first randomized controlled trial, randomly assigning students to either receive interventions or accommodations. And again, even though this is with younger children, I think it really does provide some food for thought for us about accommodations generally. So in this study, they looked at middle school students with ADHD diagnoses. That's Harrison's area of expertise. And so they randomly assigned these middle school students to either get a package of interventions for ADHD-related impairments or a package of accommodations. Some of these middle school students were given organization training so that they, for instance, wouldn't lose their assignments, wouldn't lose track of readings, those sorts of things. They were given instruction and in taking better notes. That's often when middle school is when students are often expected to start doing that. And also training in self-management, which includes time management. So they were given a lot of skill building exercises. Other students, an equivalent group, were randomly assigned to receive accommodations. They got organizational support, which meant they had a one-to-one -one aide who would meet with them occasionally, make sure their binder was organized, make sure they didn't lose assignments. Instead of getting note-taking instruction, they were given a copy of class notes. And instead of giving them time management training, they were just given extra time for turning in assignments. So I, I don't think it will surprise anyone that interventions actually led to better outcomes, both at the end of the study and especially after both of them were withdrawn. When the students who received accommodations when the study was over, they no longer had all those supports. They actually had some really significant problems. The students who had been given skill building interventions, when the interventions stopped, they still had the skills. What surprised the researchers was that the interventions were actually preferred by the students, but only after it was all over. Obviously, gaining skills, having to use those interventions can be tough. But at the end of the entire study, when students were asked, how much did you enjoy participating in this? Are you pleased that you did? It was the students who got interventions who really appreciated all of that. Now, again, I know this is for younger children. If we try to apply this at higher levels, like what about the bar exam? I was influenced by an article that came out in a law review actually back in 2019 in a journal about how time pressured performance tests prepare students not only for the bar exam, but also for actual law practice, given how often it is that attorneys needed to perform under speeded conditions where there's some amount of time pressure. Um, at times that relates, of course, to the way that law services are billed. At other times, there are just natural deadlines that are very difficult for attorneys. And I learned as a non-attorney a great deal about that from reading this article, but many of you, I, I think this will resonate with, you know this already. So I've spoken about uh, some general issues and accommodations, and I just want to give a moment, feel free, this is a, a good point, if there are any questions about the material so far or things that it would be helpful to clarify or speak more about um, before I go into another section. I'll just give folks a moment.
So, sounds like I can go into the next section, which is about research trying to figure out how to improve accommodation decision making. So I actually took this slide from my old 2020 presentation because this challenge hasn't changed. Um, Susan Phillips was a, an assessment and accommodations researcher at Michigan State back in the 90s. And um, I was a graduate student somewhat after that. I would think I probably read this article in 2005. I was just starting to do research on accommodations and I felt like the issue was so complex, I didn't even know where to start. And so reading Phillips's article, she outlined five questions that she said need to be considered when making accommodations decisions. And I've actually devoted a lot of my career to trying to answer those questions for different accommodations. So I'm gonna go through them in an orderly way and talk about what we've learned, especially in recent years about accommodations that will help us make better decisions. Most of the research on accommodations is actually focused on this first question that we think of as differential boost. Do accommodations boost the scores or benefit students with disabilities more than non-disabled students? So the data that you see in the graph here is entirely hypothetical. It's not from an actual study. These are data that would show differential boost. So you can see in these hypothetical data, students with disabilities are improved in terms of their scores when they take a test with an accommodation. In contrast, non-disabled students don't show a boost. This would be perfect differential boost. Here, it's clear that the relationship between accommodations and outcomes depends on whether you have a disability. So you can think about other sorts of disability-related services that would show differential boost effects. So for instance, individuals with disabilities who use a wheelchair would benefit differentially in terms of their access if they had a ramp instead of a step to get over, those sorts of things. In the same way, we can ask that with regard to common testing accommodations. And the answer really depends on what accommodations we look at. So we have a number of years of research looking at read aloud benefits. And there I would include anything that your state uses for read aloud, whether it be um, you know, any of the softwares that are available for text to speech. I'm not here to advertise any, but there are a number that are used, uh, Kurzweil and Dragon and things like that. Um, read aloud benefits appear to be specific. Most studies that have studied read aloud accommodations show that students who have relevant disabilities benefit a lot more from read aloud than non-disabled students do. In fact, students who are good readers often find read aloud to be annoying if it's given to them and they don't want it. Um, extended time benefits instead are not specific. So we have over 30 years of research on extended time showing that the benefits are common to students with and without disabilities. Hmm. And I'll just talk a bit more about the details of that work. So most of my research has looked at students with ADHD or learning disabilities. Again, that's been my focus. And that is, of course, the uh, largest groups of the folks applying for accommodations, including, I believe, on the bar exam, maybe psych psychiatric disabilities is also getting higher. But extended time does not exhibit differential boost for these groups. Students with ADHD or learning disabilities do not consistently benefit more from extra time than non-disabled students do. The key factor that seems to matter in predicting the benefits from extended time is just how time pressured the test is. So for instance, many students who are getting accommodations in college, many college classes, if you take a test in a history class or something like that, they're not very time pressured. Students with disabilities don't benefit much and neither do non-disabled students. If you look instead at a very pressured test, many, many law students, for instance, feel law school exams are time pressured. If they're being asked to identify legally relevant issues and complex scenarios, students both with and without disabilities will benefit from extra time there. If students have a learning disability diagnosis, they do seem to work slower at any given time point on the test. And so for college students with learning disabilities, statistics that we've done, statistical interpolation for people who are familiar with that process, suggests that about 25% extended time gives equal access. We found that the average college student who has a well-diagnosed, well-validated learning disability will need about 25% extra time to reach the same number of items on a test that a non-disabled student can reach under standard time. For ADHD, interestingly, we don't show any deficit in terms of speed. 
This doesn't mean that there won't be individual students with ADHD who need extra time, but the average college student with ADHD does not appear to, and we've found this in a number of studies, they're actually not distinguishable in terms of the pace with which they go through exams on average. So differential boost, again, is this first question that Phillips asks, and it really helps us to make better decisions, to ask whether an accommodation shows those differential boost effects. Even though extended time doesn't uh, show differential boost, it still is appropriate for students with relevant disabilities. We just want to be more careful when we make that decision. Read aloud accommodations, on the other hand, doesn't really need that caution. There may be logistical barriers to making read aloud available for all students, but if we don't need to worry as much about them read aloud providing an unfair advantage or anything like that. The second question that Phillips asks is about what she calls score comparability. When someone takes a test with accommodations, is the score that the test generates just as reliable and as valid as a score that's obtained without accommodations? So I'll show you just on these graphs a very typical way that score comparability is studied. So it's easiest to see with an admissions test. You can imagine, for instance, using the LSAT to predict first year grades in law school. So on the x-axis of these graphs, we would have the LSAT score. So you could see folks with higher scores are over on the right, score, folks with lower scores are over on the left. And then on the y-axis, it would be the outcome that the score is supposed to predict, which would be first-year law school grades. So we expect to see a positive correlation, which is what both of these graphs show. So students who have higher LSAT scores also, on average, have higher law school grades. But when we look at the two graphs, there's a difference. The scores tightly cluster around a line on the left, whereas they're more variable on the right. And so this shows that the prediction of performance in law school is weaker when the test is taken with accommodations. This is actually what research on the LSAT has found, and there have been a number of studies conducted by the Law School Admission Council on that. So this suggests, again, a reason for concern. If accommodations are provided without good evidence, they can reduce the predictive validity of a test. They can reduce the ability of the test to predict some sort of important outcome. And so that's something we should always be paying attention to. With exams for certification and licensure, and I would include the bar exam in that, it's always helpful to provide some sort of validation research. It's harder to find the outcomes there. Are the outcomes complaints? Are they ratings by employers? Those sorts of things. But I still recommend that testing entities consider conducting predictive validity research to the degree that it's feasible for any test. In part, it just helps you to show that your test is relevant, that there's some necessity for it beyond all the other ways and information that we have to judge candidates. A third question that Phillips asks, she calls task comparability. And so this is really asking whether an accommodation changes the test so much that it no longer is measuring what it was designed to measure. So you can think of test performance as being due to two types of skills what we call target skills and access skills. When we make a test, if I as a professor make a test for my students, or if you know, you're using the UBE or another test to assess folks' ready, readiness to practice law, target skills are what the test was designed to measure. That's what we usually think about. Access skills are skills that are needed just to be able to participate fairly in the test when it's administered under standard conditions. So I'll come back to this slide, but I just wanna show an example of this distinction between target skills and access skills. For many years, I taught introductory psychology, a class that many of you likely took. And so when I would make an introductory psychology test for a unit on learning and memory, I was thinking as an instructor about the skills that are shown here on the left. These are target skills. I wanted to make sure that my students had knowledge of the neurological basis of learning and memory. I wanted to make sure that my students had knowledge of different terms for memory storage areas and memory processes, all of those sorts of things. But I wasn't originally thinking about what we call access skills. To be able to fairly participate on, in the test under standard administration conditions, the students also had to have adequate visual acuity because I was giving a very typical classics paper and pencil test. The students had to have general reading skills. I wasn't trying to measure their reading comprehension, but if a student lacked reading skills, they would not be able to pass my test. I also wasn't trying to measure concentration skills, but if a student had really severe impairments in the ability to concentrate and that wasn't treated properly, then they wouldn't be able to fairly participate in the test. And if I was using a Scantron form to bubble in answers, 
and a student had really difficult uh, difficulties with fine motor skills, then that also wouldn't be fair. So we give accommodations when someone has deficits in these sorts of access skills. We don't want to accommodate someone who has deficits in target skills. If someone has difficulties with what the test is designed to measure, the test is designed to catch them. We're trying to ensure that someone who has those deficits is not moved on, that we're not certifying someone as having skills that they don't have. So because the most common accommodation is extra time, what we often should be thinking about is, is speed or fluency or automaticity. Is any time-related factor merely an access skill, or is it actually part of the target skills? Is it part of what we're trying to measure? And this is a good question for folks who are involved with testing entities to ask themselves. Is this something that we care about? Do we care about people being able to do something in a reasonable or a limited amount of time? And that will tell you whether speed or fluency falls into the target skill or the access skill bucket. Um, that's only one of the things that common disability conditions have as a deficit that could actually affect competent performance. So you might think from the perspective of a future employer or just as someone who's getting a general gauge as to whether someone has the proficiency to practice law as to whether or not these features here would impinge on that practice. Slow speed, being easily distracted, difficulty sustaining work over a period of time, um, having impairment in making careful or considered judgments, and difficulty communicating effectively. If these are skills that you actually care about candidates having, that's something to make very explicit. It's not fair to keep that a secret. It's something that should be in the test specs, as we say. It should be open that these are things that we care about. And it's helpful to communicate that with relevant education institutions as well. So we wanna make sure we're providing accommodations only for deficits and access skills. If something's a target skill that we're actually trying to measure that we wanna make sure test takers have, then an accommodation would be inappropriate. So I think that's a really helpful question of Phillips for us to think about just as folks who are involved with any testing program. The fourth question that Phillips asks is, can students with disabilities adapt to standard testing conditions? Are we providing accommodations to just improve students' comfort or reduce distress or displeasure during a test? Or are we actually doing it because students need this? So I'll come back to this slide, but one way of thinking about this is just to survey students with and without disabilities as to whether an accommodation would be desirable. So I briefly mentioned the data from surveys like this earlier, but I just wanna show you some details. So my colleagues and I about 10 years ago conducted a study at three different colleges and universities, and we wanted to make sure we had different types of students. We oversampled students with disabilities. We looked at students who were at a state university, students who were at a, a large private university and a small liberal arts college. We eventually got a sample of over 600 students total, and we asked them to rate whether or not various accommodations would help or hurt their score or whether the accommodations wouldn't do anything, they thought, on a high-stakes standardized test. And you can see here, 88.3% of students with disabilities felt that they would have a positive effect. There'd be some benefit for their score of having 50% extended time on a test. But almost just as many, 87.1% of non-disabled students felt that way. If we look at separate room, the majority of students with disabilities felt that their score would improve if they had a separate room to take the exam, but also a majority of students without disabilities felt that way. The very same thing for having additional breaks during a test. It was only when you get into these lower frequency accommodations, things where fewer than half of either group felt that they would benefit, that we see more differences. So proportionally, over twice as many students with disabilities felt that they would benefit from a test reader. And that supports the data that we saw earlier on differential boost. Read aloud really does seem to have differential benefits. Um, so just as a reminder, so this kind of should set us up to think, are we giving accommodations for the right reason? Is it because students have genuine needs for access? Or are we doing it just to improve comfort? I mentioned this earlier with extended time, but students with learning disabilities on average will need some extended time to actually be able to participate fairly in a test. The average post-secondary student appears to need about 25% extra time just for fair access, just to access the same number of items that their non-disabled peers do without accommodations. 
ADHD seems to be very different. On average, there doesn't appear to be any need for benefit. We shouldn't assume that ADHD means a need for extra time. We should be looking at the individual data in each case if we're trying to make evidence-based decisions at the level of individual candidates. Another issue that comes up with this capacity to adapt has to do with test-taking skills. And increasingly, I find that test anxiety is what relates to these test-taking skills. In fact, I've actually shifted a, a lot of my research to be about test anxiety. I started that because I found that anxiety was a basis for accommodation requests, but it's just a really important thing to study in its own right. As many of you know, um, teenagers and young adults are experiencing what appears to be unprecedented levels of anxiety, including the proportion of folks who are diagnosed formally with anxiety disorders. And so just to follow up on that, I'll talk a little bit more about anxiety. So I want to speak not from a legal perspective, but from the perspective of a licensed psychologist. Clinically, if we're trying to just help someone who has anxiety, accommodation is not generally the way to do it. And so, in fact, in the clinical psychology literature, the term accommodation has a different meaning. It refers to steps that families or someone's partner may take to essentially reduce distress in the short term if someone has anxiety or OCD. This is an article that was published, I believe, back in 2016, but it remains very relevant. And I just want to show an excerpt from it. Although often well-intentioned, accommodation interferes with the treatment for OCD and anxiety, as so that's obsessive compulsive disorder. Exposure is considered an active ingredient in the treatment for anxiety-based disorders. So in order for exposure to be effective, fear should be activated and negatively reinforced behaviors should be minimized. So that means we want to try to minimize behaviors like avoidance, because fear extinction can't occur unless the individual fully engages with the feared stimulus and allows anxiety to reduce naturally. So I know this sounds pretty abstract. What does that look like? If we start with children, if you have a child who has a phobia of dogs, and so you respond to that by getting rid of the family dog or not visiting a relative who has a dog or crossing the street when the family takes a walk if there's a dog on that side of the street, those would be examples of accommodation. That's where we're trying to reduce distress in the short term. And in the short term, it actually works very well. The problem is in the long term, it reinforces the fear. And it actually appears to interfere with evidence-based treatment. Because if you're taking that child to a psychologist for evidence-based exposure therapy, the family is doing the opposite, trying to prevent the child from ever having to interact with that feared stimulus. Test anxiety, we can't just expose someone to taking tests, and I'm happy to talk more about evidence-based treatment for test anxiety, but I'll actually go into uh, that a little bit in more detail in a moment. So if we apply accommodation in the clinical psychology world to uh, educational accommodations, uh, this was done just a couple years ago, since my last presentation. These researchers who study family accommodation began to look at the school disability services that the students in their research studies were getting. And so this paper was published a couple years ago. Phillips et al. looked at the IEPs and Section 504 plans of 76 students with anxiety disorders. Phillips and, and her colleagues were actually seeing these kids in treatment, um, but then showed those plans, those IEPs and 504 plans, to 28 different anxiety experts, clinical psychologists who work at anxiety research labs, and they were asked to rate the degree to which the accommodations promoted avoidance of anxiety. We know that avoidance is the way that anxiety builds over time. You feel good when you get to avoid whatever it is that causes anxiety, and that actually makes you feel more anxiety the next time that you encounter it. You feel an even stronger urge to get away as soon as possible. So Phillips and, and her colleagues showed the most frequently recommended school-based services to these anxiety experts. And some of these look a lot like testing accommodations that are used on the bar exam. So offering extended time on tests, allowing students to complete a test or assignment in a separate room. Others did not. So for instance, uh, providing students with additional reminder or cues, uh, repeating or clarifying instructions, uh, reducing the required work. We don't do that, at least not yet for the bar exam, but that's the so sort of thing that some schools do for children. And again, those experts were asked to rate how much these accommodations promote avoidance. So we wanna see the average expert rating pretty close to zero or maybe one. We don't want there to be much avoidance. And you can see for two of those accommodations, there was very little avoidance that those accommodations promote. So giving students an additional reminder or repeating instructions, that doesn't really seem to promote avoidance. It's not bad for anxiety clinically. 
The other accommodations really have promoted avoidance to a significant degree, offering extra time, letting students take tests or assignments in a separate room, and really reducing the amount of work for something. Those are all avoidance-based accommodations. They're really enabling someone who has anxiety to avoid something that they should be getting used to. Now, again, this is for children, so I want to talk more about adults. So Allison Harrison, no relation to Judy Harrison, who I talked about earlier, Allison Harrison and her colleagues have looked at uh, college students, graduate students, I believe law students are also included in their studies. They look at a, a Canadian university, Queen's University, where some of them are. And so they wanted to see whether or not post-secondary students who have depression and anxiety symptoms actually have deficits in being able to access a test. Are the accommodations being given because of a genuine need, or are the accommodations being given just to increase the comfort of students? So these are some quantitative data from the study, but you can see that the key thing here is the, the means are, are not in parentheses, and then the standard deviations are. So you can kind of focus on the means. Folks who have more statistics background may want to look at the standard deviations. But what's key here is that the means are pretty much the same. They're very, very similar in a group of post-secondary students with depression, a group of post-secondary students with anxiety, and then non-disabled comparison students. So students who have depression and anxiety, even to a clinical degree, do not appear to have deficits in terms of the time that they take to read or to write. And so depression and anxiety can certainly make those tasks more distressing, more uncomfortable, and folks with anxiety and depression tend to underestimate themselves. Part of the disorder involves feeling negatively about yourself, but on objective tests, these are different diagnostic tests that are used to measure timed reading and timed writing, we don't really see differences. So this suggests that when we provide accommodations for emotion-related problems like anxiety and depression, at least in the average case, we're probably increasing comfort we're definitely decreasing distress, but we're not necessarily increasing access because there's not typically an access deficit to begin with. So I, because I suspect that your entity, like a lot of testing agencies, are getting more anxiety-related requests, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, test anxiety is a topic that's been researched for many, many years. It actually, believe it or not, goes back to the 1930s when Freudian psychiatrists were writing about test anxiety. So this is a classic study now from 1987 looking at test anxiety that I'll talk about. But a key thing that researchers have examined is whether feeling anxiety during a test prevents the test score that someone gets from being valid. Because students often feel that way. If you're taking a test, you feel anxious during the test, you don't feel like you're really showing your skills because you're so uncomfortable. So in this particular study, Covington and Omelek actually invited students with high levels of test anxiety after taking a test to come in and see, can you answer these questions when the stakes of the test are removed? So if you're not actually taking a test, we're just having a conversation, I know you felt like your mind was blocked, you couldn't remember anything because of the anxiety during the exam. Let's have you now rate your anxiety after the exam is over and see if you can answer the questions. They didn't find that there was any consistent effect of reducing that anxiety or reducing those stakes. The students who couldn't answer the questions during the test typically couldn't either when it was after the test. So even when the anxiety went away, when there were no longer any consequences to performance, we didn't see that effect. Um, now, I promise there's a lot of new research as well. A remarkable study was published just a couple years ago on the top journal Psychological Science. These researchers in Germany looked at um, test anxiety and test performance in medical students who were taking their final license exam, very similar to the bar exam in that regard. So they looked at over 300 medical students and they had access through an online study system to a remarkable amount of data. So they had access to the students' test anxiety scores, the anxiety that they felt in the moment before they took an exam. They asked the students to fill out questionnaires like that. They also were able to see how much the students were self-testing with study quizzes. So they looked at lots and lots of evidence. The, these over 300 medical students completed measures of anxiety, they completed measures of what we call working memory, um, so the amount of information that your mind can hold at any given time. 
And then they also looked at their scores on the practice version and the real version of the final license exam in medicine. Um, now, that's equivalent to an exam in the United States called Step 2CK of the US MLE for folks who are familiar with that exam in, in US medical schools. So they found that test anxiety did have a slight negative relationship with performance, no surprise. Students who had higher levels of anxiety had slightly lower test performance in terms of their final exam score. But the key question is, was it the anxiety that was reducing performance or were the students performing uh, worse for other reasons, less studying, they didn't know the information as much, and that in turn caused the anxiety. The students were anxious for a good reason in that case. So Theobald et al. looked into this using all the different sorts of data they had. And they found, for instance, that test anxiety did not predict how much someone's score changed from the mock exam to the real exam. Even when the stakes of the exam went up a great deal, test anxiety didn't seem to predict how much your score would drop when you were under those high stakes, high pressure conditions. That suggests that test anxiety wasn't doing the heavy lifting. It wasn't actually changing someone's score. They also found that test anxiety did not predict the final exam performance when students mock exam performance was statistically controlled. So that means if we look at students who had the same performance on the mock exam, they would perform the same on the real exam regardless of their test anxiety. So finally, test anxiety did not predict real exam performance after controlling for how someone did on the self-study quizzes. So it seemed to these researchers, and we have some other studies showing as well, anxiety may affect someone's study behaviors and that in turn affects their exam performance. But if someone keeps studying in the most efficient, appropriate, evidence-based, effective ways, the anxiety is not going to have a sizable effect on their performance in most typical cases. It can make taking the exam really unpleasant. Um, of course, if we provided accommodations for most cases of test anxiety, that would probably be most examinees. And I should note, even though this was with test anxiety, even if a student has a disorder diagnosis like generalized anxiety disorder, obviously genuine, often very valid diagnosis, it's the anxiety during the test that we really care about. So I would apply these results to those sorts of cases as well. It's not just test anxiety per se, but anxiety-based disorders that cause anxiety during a test. So all of this research really fits under Phillips's fourth question about whether students with disabilities can adapt to standard testing conditions. Many students with disabilities can. Many can still access a test under standard conditions. It's just more effortful or it's unpleasant. And I get that as a psychologist, I care a lot about that. And we have interventions that are often very effective. Whether that causes someone to not be able to access the test though is key when we're making accommodations decisions. And that's actually, I think, a good transition into Phillips's final question. Are we making accommodation decisions in a reliable and valid way? From the perspective of examinees and candidates, it often feels like we're just flipping a coin. It feels arbitrary. Why was I denied accommodations? Someone else was given accommodations. And I get that. I actually sympathize a tremendous amount with that because at times I, I see decisions being made in somewhat arbitrary ways without clear evidence-based procedures. So I have some recommendations for improving that, but I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about Phillips's question in that regard. So first we can ask ourselves, you know, how reliable are the diagnoses in the first place? And we know that different, uh, different diagnosticians, different clinicians diagnose high frequency disorders in different ways. So I'll come back to this slide, but just to take an example, learning disabilities, as I mentioned, are diagnosed in many different ways. There are some states that still diagnose based on a discrepancy, a gap between someone's IQ and their achievement. Some folks just use a low achievement model. In fact, the DSM, the official handbook for diagnosing psychological disorders, really relies on low academic skills, low achievement. In California, I believe the primary way of assessing K-12 students in the schools is with what we call a pattern of strengths and weaknesses model, a profile of all the students' different ability and achievement areas is examined. That's yet a different way. And then some states look at how much a student responds to different educational interventions and diagnoses a learning disability when a student fails to respond to multiple ways of teaching the material. So lots of different ways to assess these, and we see similar kinds of variability in the way that ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, and other disorders are diagnosed. 
So that's why it's helpful to not just rely on the diagnosis when we're making accommodation decisions. We should be looking for particular types of evidence that someone cannot access a test under standard conditions. And in a moment, I'll talk about that in greater detail. Um, the one thing I wanna talk about before I move on is how colleges make accommodation decisions, because this would actually include, I believe, law schools as well. Many times it's the same disability services office that makes accommodation decisions at different levels of education and for different parts of universities. Obviously, someone's history of accommodations is important information, but there's an interesting question. Can we rely on that alone to make accommodations decisions? Should we assume that if someone has a history of accommodations, they therefore need them? Can we be absolutely sure of that? Alison Harrison and her colleague Irene Armstrong did a remarkable study just published a couple years ago that I'm eager to show you. Um, here it was published in the journal Psychological Injury and Law, Accommodation Decision Making for Post-Secondary Students, Treating the Able as Disabled. So this is a, a rare type of study. Harrison and Armstrong actually generated a fake neuropsychological evaluation report. They created a fake diagnostic evaluation report and sent it to 50 higher education institutions. So they sent this report asking, would this qualify the student to get accommodations at your institution? And so the report stated that the data were most consistent with the presence of ADHD and that the student would benefit from additional time on exams. But the researchers very carefully ensured that all of the data did not support accommodations. So all of the rating scales on ADHD symptom ratings were in the average range, T-scores below 59 or, or equal to 59 or below for folks who are looking at a lot of evaluation reports. Um, also in the report, they said that ADHD symptoms did not start until the end of 10th grade. That actually automatically means the person does not qualify for ADHD. ADHD symptoms in the DSM have to start by age 12. Um, and then there were reports of all A grades without formal accommodations in high school. Um, diagnostic performance testing on measures of ability and achievement all were in the average range. So they designed this report to have really no direct evidence whatsoever of someone having ADHD, but they wrote a conclusion saying symptoms are most consistent with ADHD and the person would benefit. And then again, sent this to 50 different higher education institutions. 49 of the 50 institutions replied. Um, 23 of the replies were from people who actually were authorized to make decisions. 23 of those 23 responses, 100% of those responses were all positive. Every single decision maker said, yes, based on this report, this student would receive accommodations at our institution. Um, so that was really remarkable. The other responses came from people who were not authorized to make decisions, and they all either said, nonetheless, that there would be a positive decision made by the person who could make it, or they reassured the sender that extended time was commonly given, or they mentioned that an appointment would be made with a decision maker. So for all the responses that were clear in terms of the outcome, even though none of the data in this evaluation supported ADHD or accommodation needs, quite the opposite. The researchers made sure of that. Nonetheless, this evaluation would lead to that student then having a history of accommodations in college and likely in law school as well again. So this was really kind of shocking just a few years ago, just a couple of years ago, this study came out, really interesting. So based on this, the fact that accommodation decisions appear to be made in ways that are often unreliable and invalid, I wanna suggest some improvements for that. And we can talk about how that might apply to the bar exam in particular, but you won't be surprised at what I start with. We wanna focus on functional limitations, call it substantial limitations if you like, given ADA, not just the diagnosis itself. For those model cases of accommodations like vision problems, orthopedic problems, a diagnosis may be sufficient. But when we look at high incidence disability conditions, ADHD, learning disabilities, we need to look at the actual data for functional limitations. And it's important that someone have absolute deficits, not just deficits in some areas that are relative to strengths in others. Again, having average reading skills when you have a really high IQ doesn't make you disabled in reading. Any more than having average swimming skills, if you're a long distance runner, mean that you have disability with regard to swimming. So average skills compared to the general population are what we should be looking for. 
we should always keep in mind what the symptom base rates are. When someone's reporting having a type of impairment or a functional limitation, is that common or is it not? Again, I'll reference a recent study. This is again just from 2022. Julie Sir and her student Ellen Johnson surveyed 400 students at, I imagine, their university, undergraduate students who were not seeking any treatment or reporting any disability as part of the study, and just ask them whether they experience different sorts of symptoms that folks who request accommodations often report. So for those of you who are used to looking at personal statements or applications for accommodations, I think these symptoms on the left will all look familiar to you. Students who report, I can't focus on assigned readings because they're too boring. I procrastinate or put off things until the last minute. I need to reread things several times to process the information. I make careless mistakes on exams. I have to work harder than my friends to get good grades, and I have trouble finishing time tasks. At least some of these I've seen often in accommodation requests. But when you look at the general population of post-secondary students, when you see our folks reporting these, you know, the majority of, of students with, without any reported disabilities are nonetheless reporting these sorts of symptoms at least sometimes. And met very many of them, a very substantial minority, almost half or at least a third, or at least in this case, a fifth, are reporting experiencing these things often. So when we see these sorts of responses or statements, we actually have some hard objective evidence now that these are not indicative of disability. Someone with a disability may well have these sorts of symptoms, but they're also common in students without disabilities. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, let's see. So when we ask then, is someone unusual? Do they have substantial limitations in terms of having atypical levels of skills required to access a test? We know that the normal distribution or bell curve is how most of these skills are distributed. Um, you know, what I often recommend is for performance measures, we wanna see something below the average range, which normally means below the 25th percentile. So when I train my students and I give professional development workshops for diagnosticians, I'm, I often use the 25th percentile as a cutoff for that. When we're looking to ask whether or not symptoms are unusual, some, are someone's symptoms severe enough to actually be unusual? Instead, higher scores represent more severe symptoms. And for many rating scales, for many questionnaires, we require that symptoms be one and a half standard deviations above the mean. That's usually around the 93rd percentile. The person would be in the top 7% of the population in terms of the severity of their symptoms. Now, because diagnostic evaluations have so many measures, we can ask, well, what measures should we be paying the most attention to? If you've seen a comprehensive psychological evaluation report, you've probably seen dozens, if not hundreds of different test scores. Should we be looking at intellectual measures, neuropsychological measures, academic measures, rating scales of personality and behavior? For making accommodation decisions, I think it's the academic measures that are most key. We're looking for measures that are the best indicator of need on academic tests. The bar exam is an academic test in the sense that the skills needed to access it are things like reading and writing skills. Those are the key academic skills that we wanna look for. So when I review a diagnostic evaluation report, I'm paying particular attention to someone's performance on academic tests. And it's not just the diagnostic tests, as I'll say, there are other sources of information too, and they should align. So in a valid case, we should see low diagnostic achievement test scores. We should see low real world performance. So school performance, actual grades, test scores, assignment performance that's low, if those academic skills are required. And then prior real world tests that are completed without accommodations should also be low. The data should agree, they should converge on the same conclusion. So it's the academic test that I would recommend focusing on if you're trying to make those sorts of evidence-based decisions. Um, my own research has looked at this in some detail. I wanna show data from a study that's a little bit old now, 2017. My colleagues and I looked at what predicts how long it takes people to take a typical academic test. So we gave over 250 college students a very typical academic reading test. Um, you may see this in diagnostic evaluations. It's called the Nelson-Denny reading test. We told them to work for speed as well as accuracy. We told them to work quickly, but without making mistakes if possible. And then we timed them to see how long they would take. We wanted to see what was a predictor of the amount of time they took. And we also looked at three different predictors. 
So we looked at a processing speed score from an IQ test. Many of you see this if you're looking at IQ test results, if you're, if you're reviewing a diagnostic evaluation report. We looked at a reading fluency test from the Woodcock-Johnson battery. There you have to read simple sentences as quickly as possible and say yes or no to each one. Simple sentences like a dog has four legs, stuff like that. Um, and then finally, we looked at a self-report questionnaire about how much they thought they needed extra time the degree to which they reported that they were a slow reader and a slow test taker. And so for time, I'm going to go a little bit quickly now, but um, these are the items on that self-report scale. Things like I'm a slow reader, I finish exams early, that's scored in the opposite direction, things like that. So again, we were trying to predict how long they would take to finish the Nelson-Denny comprehension test. So um, the correct answers on the test actually didn't predict it at all. Time seemed to be independent of how... Um, uh, good someone was at answering the items. Processing speed showed a slight correlation, so that's not too different from zero. Uh, reading fluency showed a bigger correlation. It was actually much bigger, so reading speed mattered a lot more than processing speed. And then the self-report questionnaire was not a bad predictor. It's just that you can't only rely on self-reports when there's an incentive to report a need for accommodations. So in a research study, that danger isn't there. In a real-life accommodations context, there's an incentive. Um, so this again suggests that academic tests are the most relevant ones when we're looking at all the different things that we see in a report. If someone's requesting accommodations on an exam that requires reading and writing, we should see how they perform on reading and writing measures. Um, so I know that our, our time is a little bit limited, and so I'm, I have some other things, but I'm very happy to take questions. I know I've already spoken about a lot, um, but very happy to, to answer things that you might want to talk about or go into more detail on anything. Dr. Lovett, um, Please. we really appreciate uh, such a thorough uh, presentation, um, data-driven, um, statistically driven. We appreciate that. So I want to open up uh, the forum for questions from our fellow board members. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. So I have a question. I think this is more towards staff, um, actually. Um, bar staff. I was really intrigued by the whole uh, notion of inequity um, in um, uh, in all of this. And there seems to be a very high correlation to um, systemic socio-demographic determinants in terms of this kind of stuff. So my question to the um, bar staff is, one, do we have any data on demographic um, the demographic breakdown of uh, testing accommodation requests to see if it might skew a certain way. And two, are we enabling inequity um, by the way we, we handle these requests, or are we addressing this to meet the diversity, equity, and inclusion goals of the bar? That's my question. So Larry, to answer your question, this is Christina. Um, we do not track um, diversity as um, in relation to testing accommodations. Um, in fact, when our consultants look at files, uh, they don't even have names associated with those files. We use a numbering system. And we don't have socioeconomic data generally on our applicants, right? That is correct. We don't, uh, not that I'm aware of on the bar uh, exam application. I'm not aware of us even asking that question. Yeah, but they, I've seen um, numbers with X percent black, X percent Latino, blah, blah, blah. So somebody's tracking it somewhere. Uh, that, the, the diversity questions we do have on the bar exam application, um, not, not economics um, or financials. Uh, but we do not look at um, the diversity as compared to testing accommodations, who's requesting it, who's being granted it. So in other words, there might be an equity going on precisely for the reasons that we just heard in this presentation, and we're not really aware of them, and therefore we're not addressing them. Correct. It is not something that we uh, look at, correct. So I'm just flagging it. It's, you know, you, you know, it's really important for the bar to, you know, in everything we do, it's, it, there's a connection to that. And this is a, an excellent example that probably a lot of people wouldn't even think about 
until, you know, this was really fascinating because it really uh, shows um, that there's something going on there. Christina, could uh, this is Michael? Can we take out? Can we take down the presentation? Oh, sure. So yeah, I'm see very everyone, happy to. That's okay. Oh, yeah, thank yeah, you, Doctor cool. Lovett. Appreciate sure. that. Yeah, I uh, I also appreciate the point about uh, looking at uh, systemic reasons of uh, and, and applying it to this. But I had a, a different kind of well, kind of a related question, uh, and you've touched on it, uh, Doctor Lovett. Uh, a lot of times we get cases where a person will say, or an applicant will say, well, you know, I, I've just been recently diagnosed with ADHD, meaning that they didn't get intervention uh, in an earlier time in their life. So that's one factor. Uh, and a lot of times these and other individuals are saying, well, you know, they were already granted, say, time and a half, but now I need double time. And so with all of the information that you've given, there's so many factors to try to judge, well, do they deserve it, do they not? Should we look at the accommodations they've had in the past, accommodations they've had in law school, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I'm not sure that there's uh, an actual threshold or a, a rule of thumb to help our decision making. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. There's a lot there in what you've mentioned, and I'll actually start where you did by talking about folks who have late or recent diagnoses. There are obviously a lot of very good reasons why someone who has a genuine and at times quite impairing disability condition may not have been diagnosed until late, including even in law school. So at times that's due to healthcare access, at times that's due to unfortunately neglect in the home, all sorts of things. Um, and socioeconomic factors are certainly at play there. To me, ensuring that folks who have late diagnoses have an opportunity to nonetheless receive accommodations if appropriate is an equity issue in itself, because often it's access that it determines if someone can get an early diagnosis. Um, nonetheless, there are some disorders that require an onset of symptoms early. And so ADHD and learning disabilities are among them. So even if someone doesn't have any early diagnosis of ADHD or learning disabilities, there should be evidence of problems in childhood nonetheless. In fact, the fact that there was no diagnosis or treatment means that there should be even clearer evidence of impairment. If someone had, uh, had ADHD or learning disabilities than they did as a child as well, and so if there was no diagnosis, no treatment, then I expect to see some evidence of really often significant problems early on because there was no intervention being done. So that's I, one I, thing, I'm sorry. Uh, no, well, I've also seen cases where, mm -hmm. kind of speaking to what you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, the late diagnosis, a, a lot of times we've had consultants that have said, well, you know, if we give them more time, that doesn't level the playing field, that gives them an advantage. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So to me, that both possibilities are the case. It really depends on the candidate. So if we provide extra time to someone who has deficits in reading fluency, for instance, objective validated deficits in the speed at which that individual can read, so we, we know we have objective evidence showing that that person needs more time to read the same amount that a non-disabled individual would under standard time, providing an accommodation in that case levels the playing field. It does not provide an unfair advantage. If instead we provide extended time where there is not evidence of a specific fluency-related or speed-related need, then it absolutely would provide an unfair advantage. So that's why I, I really emphasize looking at evidence. Where is the evidence that this individual candidate actually needs that particular accommodation? Because I, I think the consultants who say that are correct about the potential for accommodations if they're used improperly to provide an unfair advantage. When they're used properly, they don't provide that. They simply make up for the deficit that you should have objective evidence of. Uh, I hope that helps. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Doctor. Sure. So following up on that, um, the nature of the bar exam and, and the legal knowledge we're talking about, the identification of issues, the application of, uh, you know, of those principles and getting the answer down in writing. Um, it does extra time really help? And mm -hmm. I, I struggle with whether, mm -hmm. and I've yet to receive data. Um, does it help somebody who is, isn't really a slow reader? Um, because ultimately, if they don't know the materials, uh, five times the hours probably isn't going to help much, right? At least 
I suspect that. It's a great question. It really depends on the type of item. So for instance, if you're given a complex scenario, which parts of the bar exam typically have, and you're being graded based on your ability to recognize legal issues in that scenario, having more time generally benefits folks. So even apart from whatever their reading speed is, someone who is gonna get a higher score if they identify more relevant legal issues or provide a more thorough analysis, anyone with more time could provide that more thorough analysis. So it really depends on the type of item. If it's a very simple fact-based multiple choice question that has a minimal amount of text, then I would agree with you. It would be unlikely that extra time would be likely to help someone. Uh, Kareem, you have a question, Kareem? Your hands up? Yeah. Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Lovett, for your presentation. Um, and thank you to the team for actually putting this together. I don't know whose um, idea it was, but great idea, great discussion. Uh, so Dr. Lovett, I am actually a doctoral candidate, and I've worked on K-12 analysis of like government policy, IEP, Section 504s. Um, and so I just wanted to ask a little more in depth, and Larry kind of sparked this when he made his comment um, about the socioeconomic status of the people that are being studied, um, because kind of some of the research that I've seen hasn't really narrowed in on like people from communities like mine, which are uh, historically low income, underserved, underrepresented. And so what I've always had an issue with standardized testing is it really isolates folks that come from um, very well established communities as a and then it all and then, but it also creates barriers for those that lack resources thereof. Mm -hmm. So um, give me kind of your uh, understanding of that and how that um, attributes to what our role is um, as as people who actually make decisions on these kind of accommodations with that general understanding. Absolutely. So you're really talking to two related issues. The first one is, do we see a distribution of 504 plans or IEPs that where there are disparities in terms of who's receiving them? The second issue, which is connected that you're raising, is are the tests themselves fair for folks of different backgrounds? And mm -hmm. so I think it's great to really connect those two things. We have a lot of data on the first one. So we do have a great deal of data on 504 plans showing that inequitable distribution, showing those disparities. Students from more affluent schools are more likely to receive 504 plans. So that question is a simpler one. The harder mm -hmm. question is, are tests like a bar exam or for an admissions test for that matter, fair for students of different backgrounds? And for that, we really have to go to what's the validity data for the test? So, you know, part of the way that a bar exam is validated or any certification or licensure exam, usually the focus is on what we call content validity. Are, is the content of the items, is it mapping onto the skills that have been determined that they matter for bar practice or for law practice, something like that? Um, it's great if we're able to get a representative sample um, of folks who are making those decisions who come from different backgrounds. So the way that we often do that is ensure that if we have a team of people who are writing items or generating a content outline, that they come from diverse backgrounds. And that's something that I always recommend to testing entities, that they be screening their teams for diversity when they're looking at that. Another thing that I also recommend, and you know, it's not, my, it's not personal, it's a very, a very common recommendation, is that items be reviewed by a diverse panel that's independent. So you have folks who weren't involved in creating an item, uh, the item, they don't have a bias towards already accepting and saying, yes, this is great, but you have folks who are independent and it's great if you're able to get a sample of attorneys who have diverse backgrounds, for instance, who are reviewing those items to see, are there any potential sources of unfairness in the content there? Um, because as you say, it's connected to the issue of accommodations, but it also needs to be studied independently. We need to make sure that the tests are valid for folks from different backgrounds. Awesome. I, I really appreciate your response. And one of the things that I've seen, I guess, in my time on the CBE that I could speak for um, is that we have embraced DIA initiatives. I just I, I but I'm but I'm also cognizant of like the amount of resources now being brought into um, K 
communities of color that are historically underrepresented is that there was a big funding practice shift in 2012 with the LCAP, LCFF. And so what that meant is there was more resources for families to get access. And so when I do see these disability um, applications and I see late diagnoses, I'm, I'm looking at them like, okay, the, obviously something shifted in our state policy that allowed more access to these resources and also more support at the K-12 side. So as it translates into the higher education aspect, we're still within a decade that this has been done. And so I guess overall, I guess for me as a member of this committee, I, I operate with that lens. Um, so to hear your research and your and your response, it just shows and further reinforces that we're going in the right direction, maybe not as fast as we should. But we also had the pandemic that kind of set us back um, overall, because then the money shifted to a different kind of access when it was just Internet connectivity. So um, just got to say, Dr. Levitt, thank you. I, I oh, really appreciate that you were here yeah. today. Oh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Two more questions. Uh, sure. Sure. Both. Uh, one is we received a public comment this morning to the effect that you um, you do not um, recommend relying upon uh, uh, the um, opinions of clinicians who are actually treating the people. You don't give enough weight to that, contrary to what the commenter believed were ADA requirements. And the second is, um, with the um, diagnostic tests, uh, do they have problems, equity problems, um, uh, di you know, dealing with diverse um, testees? Yeah, so two different issues. Very happy to talk about both. So with regard to the first one, I try to be cognizant of the role that I'm playing at any moment in terms of what my responsibilities are. So if I'm being asked as a clinician or as a researcher about whether I agree with another clinician's view or another diagnostician's view, I can offer an independent opinion. If I'm being asked by a testing entity for my opinion, then I'm not the decision maker, but I'm offering my view of a situation, my reading of the data. I certainly take into account other folks' opinions and someone who actually administered the tests has an understanding of things that may not have made it into the report. Um, I certainly do, but obviously there may be disagreement about the amount to which those things are weighed or weighted, I should say. Um, and I, I apologize, the second uh, comment. You is, there, is there an equity problem with the diagnostic tests that um, uh, people yeah. would, such as you would be using uh, to inform us? Yeah, it's a great question. So there, there actually is much more research that, that I'm aware of on the fairness and lack of bias in testing. So test developers who make diagnostic tests are very cognizant of those issues. So when we rate behavior, for instance, for ADHD, or we're administering diagnostic achievement tests, the test developers and then independent researchers conduct a great deal of analyses to ensure that the tests don't show statistical bias. Just to give a few examples, they make sure that different items correlate with each other to the same degree. They make sure that the tests predict some sort of outcome equally for students from different backgrounds. So there I'm very familiar with that because those are published in peer-reviewed journals, and many of them are in the test diagnostic manuals themselves. Um, when testing agencies do research on bias and fairness, it doesn't always get published publicly, and there are times good reasons for that, but I'm not always aware of those. With diagnostic tests, we actually have a great deal of folks who are appropriately committed to making sure that there's a lack of bias in diagnostic testing. Thank you. This has been very informative. Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, does that? Uh, do you have any more questions, Paul? No. Okay, great. Are, are there any other questions for Dr. Lovett from our board members? Okay. Seeing none, we really appreciate uh, your time, Dr. Lovett, for an, an excellent uh, presentation once again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Very much appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Moving on, we're going to uh, go back to agenda item number three under operations and management, which is the um, discussion item, which is update on cost reduction initiatives related to the bar exam beginning with the February 2025 administration. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Audrey. Perfect. Uh, before I start, I did want to say um, 
in terms of getting Dr. Lovett as a presenter and why he was here today, you have yourselves to thank because that's part of the CBE work plan to have this presentation. But of course, thanks to Christina for organizing it. And I do have a note to look at the feasibility of looking at historical testing accommodation petitions that we have granted and the demographic data we do collect. So thank you for that um, in your questions as well. But moving on, I'll share my screen uh, for the next presentation. Uh, so Cody, Amy, and I are going to kind of share this presentation, but I'll start. Um, so uh, overall, we're looking at what we kind of mentioned earlier, even in the director's report, which is the Office of Admissions is facing an ongoing structural deficit. Um, one of the, well, no, the major cost center is um, the testing facilities that we run. Uh, the large ones and and the smaller ones for accommodated applicants. So the large cost reduction we're talking about today concerns uh, changing vendors for the multi-state bar exam, the MBE questions, or possibly even the written questions, which could uh, save in two ways. It could be cheaper just on the test development side, and it would allow for cost-effective administration of those questions because we wouldn't be tied to administering them at our own facilities. So today we're kind of going over all of that with you and then looking for your feedback um, for further exploration uh, leading to our next uh, CBE meeting. Uh, so I, I mentioned this earlier as well at the February Board of Trustees meeting, uh, the final budget was approved and uh, in that budget, it does discuss how our fund, the admissions fund, is projected to be insolvent by the beginning of 2026. So we have done all the fee increases. There's the remaining fee increase related to the Cal accredited fees, um, but that's not sufficient enough. We're again are looking at this large cost center, all the exam related expenses, the exam development um, expenses, paying for the MBE questions uh, that are provided by the NCBE, what we've had to increase with our proctor pay, our per hour rates in California for those proctors. And when we can't source proctors directly, we pay temp agencies and we pay their fees on top of the hourly rate. And then, of course, the direct cost of the facilities themselves, uh, large facilities like convention centers and then smaller ones we use for accommodated applicants. So what we're looking at today is how we can move to a more cost effective bar exam administration as soon as February 2025. So I will turn it over to Cody. Great, thank you so much, Audrey. Um, I wanna point out that um, this discussion, uh, I think is a continuation of discussions that we've had with the committee um, about um, exploring alternative bar exam administration models. So last year we researched the one day remote exam model uh, to reduce costs. And although at the time that model uh, wasn't feasible for July, 2024, through that work and research, we've identified these options um, that are cost effective and are alternative to our current in-person administration. And what has come out of this research are options such as um, uh, fully remote exams or vendor-owned test center models that we'll talk about shortly. So it's staff's belief that the state bar can secure the greatest financial benefits as well as operational benefits if it had the flexibility to administer the entirety of the bar exam using one of those approaches, either a vendor-owned test center model, uh, fully remote, or through a combination of both methods. And Audrey touched on it. Um, currently, uh, the state bar lacks the flexibility it needs to pursue those options due to the fact that the NCBE restricts the ad administration of the MBE through either the remote or vendor-owned test center Model. So this really is constraining the state bar's ability to uh, opt for one of these more cost-effective exam administration approaches. Um, and so we've kind of teed this up, but the solution proposed is, is sort of twofold. It's that the state bar develop. Oh, Cody. Yes. Cody, could I could I just stop you for a second and sure. ask a, a question? Why do you think, or what have we learned? Why does the uh, NCBE take that position that they want the exam administered 
in person. Uh, do you think that it's because they feel that's the best way to ensure the integrity of the exam? You know, I'm not sure I know the the stated intent. I, I could, you know, assume some is possibly related to um, what they believe to be exam security of their materials. But Audrey or Amy, perhaps you have more. There, that's how until the pandemic, that's how all all of the questions were always delivered. Right. So they were always delivered jurisdiction run uh, facilities. During the pandemic, they allowed uh, jurisdictions to pivot to using a, a smaller number of um, MBE questions remotely. But I think that experience, and, and maybe it was with the style of, as you all remember, the style of remote proctoring we had, which was the record and review model, where um, it's not live remote proctoring. And I, I don't want to speak for the NCBE, but I don't know that that experience with that model made them want to pursue um, using that style for their questions in the future. They are looking for uh, some test center use with the new exam. So in the next gen exam, they are allowing test centers for accommodated applicants, but I just don't know with them having to run uh, two exams at once, maybe there's just too many concerns about uh, the exam security and also what they're pivoting to with the uh, jurisdictions already signing on for their new exam. Again, I'm, it's hard to speak for them, but that's that is my sense. Well, I, I know, I I know that's something that we really addressed with them over and over during the pandemic and after. I just wondered if you had a, a sense. I appreciate it, Audria. I know how hard you've been working on this. And Cody, let me just ask one more thing: uh, is this is the finance is the wanting to save money? Is that the only thing that's driving this? It's not to make the bar fairer or better for the applicants. I'm, this is strictly about cost control. Is, is, is that the goal here only? I, I don't see any other goals. Well, well, I think the the cost savings is a primary driver, but um, you know, as part of the the previous research we brought to the committee related to remote exams, there was a major emphasis put on the ability for these models to be compatible with testing accommodations. Um, there have been, uh, we've pre presented information about, um, you know, certain conveniences or inconveniences for these approaches. So there are other considerations. Um, today's discussion, I think, is primarily focused on the ability to secure those cost savings, but that certainly isn't the only piece of this conversation. And frankly, when we, we get to the discussion, I think we'd love to hear some of your considerations and thoughts as well. And I think in looking, like Cody was saying, looking at the post um, exam surveys that we've done, asking applicants how they might like to take the exam in the future, there's a lot of um, responses about uh, the desire to to not take the test in those giant convention centers or or like we might have heard, you know, we talked about before something like Cal Palace where, you know, there's not just the uh, you have to pick a temperature at a giant convention center room, but you also are in there with the palpable stress of uh, 1200 of your new best friends. Right. So I think there are lots of different things that we have when we've uh, surveyed applicants after the fact that I think might be added additive benefits to having more uh, flexibility with the way that we administer the exam that would be applicant friendly. But Cody is right. Uh, cost is the main driver, but I don't think that this uh, decision would uh, do anything but lead to some more uh, applicant benefits. Also, the 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 bar has to pick large areas to have the um, exam. And if applicants had a choice of remote or a test center, they they may not have to drive two hours to go to, you know, from um, somewhere, you know, north of Sacramento where they, they want to, you know, take a test and they have to drive. They might be able to have a test center or test in their own home and that would reduce travel time. So uh, there's probably a lot of different benefits we could talk about, but yes, cost is the main driver. Thanks. Thanks, Audrey. I, are other um, the state bars having similar um, problems with, um, you know, running a deficit? And if so, are they, does it make sense to, you know, form some kind of coalition to put pressure on on the MB? I think uh, California is unique in terms of some of the pricing of, of what we have, not just for the facilities, but again, for the uh, proctor hourly rates. Um, but there is a disruption just naturally in bar exam 
and jurisdictions because of the next gen is on the horizon. So this this version of the NCBE's test, the the UBE or what we use, which is just the MBE, is is going away. So I think there's a natural disruption where states are figuring out what is the future of how they want to test. Um, so I think there are a lot of jurisdictions uh, thinking about these things. Um, and if you followed, you know, the Blue Ribbon Commission, there are states that are looking at alternative pathways to licensure that might only have uh, an assessment component as a small piece in supervised practice. So there's lots going on in the space. Um, so I think, yeah, potentially down the road, you know, at least best practices, if not um, sharing something overall with other jurisdictions could certainly be explored. So continuing to use their uh, multi-state, uh, multiple choice test is not an option at some point. It's not an option. That is right. They are um, going to cease uh, making that those questions available by the February 2028 bar exam. So then it won't matter. Then we can do, so then we can do whatever we want, right? Um, if we're not using we're them. going to have to be yes yeah, so it, so you know the at the court has the supreme court has a blue ribbon commission recommendations to develop a california exam um so that's what the the blue ribbon commission and the board of trustees uh put forward to the supreme court um there's also the next gen exam that is out there so there yeah we're not sure yet in terms of the future of our bar, bar exam what direction that will go but we're talking about what to do now <laughs> How we how we cost, uh, cut costs now? That's the conversation that we have to have. Are, are there any other questions, or or can we should we let Cody finish his presentation? Yep, I know. I just saw. <laughs> that. I just saw that. Thank you. Well, um, I do want to just connect the dots real quick while Audrey's um, bringing that uh, the slide deck back up. I, I think there is a connection, um, uh, between the two comments made, which is, you know, to some extent, some changes to the exam questions, particularly around the MBE are inevitable. And what this proposal really suggests is that we can kind of expedite that process so that we can, uh, achieve these budgetary goals, um, sooner, but it essentially brings forward the timeline for what would be an inevitable change to the exam anyway. Um, okay, so back to where we are at, and I just want to uh, real quickly just be clear here. So what we're suggesting as a solution is kind of twofold. First is developing and owning our own bank of multiple choice questions. And because of that, we would have the ability to adopt one of these alternative cost-effective exam administration methods. Okay, so now let's go over to the next slide. So developing the exam questions with a new vendor. Um, we are in very early conversations with potential vendors that um, are capable of developing both the multiple choice questions, these MBE-like questions, and perhaps also uh, written essays and performance tests um, as well. I don't think we've touched on that. Um, very initial information suggests that developing multiple choice questions with a new vendor uh, could be accomplished at a cost comparable to the current expense uh, for procuring the MBE materials alone. And also if we pursued an option where it was both components of the exam, the multiple choice and the written components, um, it is comparable in cost for the entire exam development. Um, and I wanna highlight this, this second point I think is very important. We are, very much aware of the critical need to maintain the exam standards of validity and reliability when developing these new questions. We are confident that um, dependable new questions can be created using some of the same content validation methods that were implemented in 2023 for refreshing the multiple choice questions for the first year law students examination. We're also working closely with psychometrician Chad Beckendahl Buckendall, who's going to present, I think, later today uh, or, or shortly to identify uh, some of those methods as well. Um, and it's also really important to note that we are not proposing alterations to the exam itself. The proposal is to change the vendor responsible for the for exam development of those questions to facilitate alternative administration methods, but the format and content will remain unchanged 
uh, which removes the need for, for substantial modifications for training or preparation for the examination. And I know that's a really important um, detail. So with that, I think uh, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Amy Nunez as well. All right, thank you, Cody. So if the uh, state bar is able to procure multiple choice questions from an alternate, alternate vendor, uh, we'd be able to achieve cost savings and we're exploring these three options to be able to do so. The first is a full remote um, option. Uh, we have met with multiple vendors and continue to do so to identify a vendor that would be able to accommodate both the volume of applicants that sit for the California bar exam and that can suitably address the needs of all of our examinees. Um, the second option is uh, exploring the use of test centers. Um, the cost uh, could, uh, savings that could be achieved uh, includes the fact that we would no longer need to secure and manage uh, the exam facilities. Uh, Audrey touched upon this earlier, recruiting and managing the volume of proctors required for each exam would uh, be eliminated. And so um, as a result, we are in discussion with uh, leading test center vendors, um, exploring the possibility uh, that they would facilitate uh, this as a um, exam administration method. And the last uh, that, uh, that Cody's also uh, touched on is involves a combination of the first two options, that is combining remote and test centers. And this hybrid approach also needs to consider other issues. Uh, whether we'd be uh, able to allow applicants to choose their preferred method, uh, to provide a remote exam administration to testing accommodation applicants, or uh, whether there would be a fixed capacity for both options given the volume of applicants that we have in California. Um, obviously, all of these options depend on the state bar's ability to replace the MBE, uh, but we estimate uh, a cost savings of approximately $2 million with um, either of these models. Now, <clears throat> as for next steps, staff continue to explore uh, with multiple vendors, uh, but today we bring this to the committee for feedback. And because additionally, we are seeking to work with a couple of volunteer committee members to assist staff, to assist us in the exploration uh, to identify a vendor to produce MBC, MBE like uh, multiple choice questions, as well as exploring the uh, administration uh, methods that we've uh, described here. So um, between the months of March and April, uh, we the idea would be for staff to work with the volunteer liaisons um, to seek um, and gather input from stakeholders regarding the proposed changes. And then in April, uh, staff and the liaisons would bring a proposal to the full committee for discussion. Um, the goal is for the staff to present recommendations for uh, to the board in, at the May meeting for adoption. And so um, this is a time frame that we're uh, working um, against. And so um, we also have invited uh, Dr. Chad Buckendall, our psychometrician, to come here. And he's going to be discussing the methodology that we want to employ that he will employ to ensure that we're able to utilize MBE-like questions in a way that's psychometrically sound and that wouldn't jeopardize um, exam validity or reliability. And so with that, I think we wanna uh, invite uh, Dr. Buckendall, here he is. Um, and I think he has a PowerPoint presentation. I do, Amy, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I, am I able to share directly? From my screen or you are okay great let me pull that um presentation up and so um i, I appreciate dr lovett's presentation earlier because uh i'll be reinforcing some of the things that he recommended school psych is kind of a uh, a sister profession to the educational psychology um uh work that my colleagues and i do and so uh, counseling psych, clinical psych, uh, all this is like cognitive uh, stuff. So we're we're all um, kind of colleagues in this space. For the bar exam itself, as staff has been speaking about, um, the kind of the, the critical evidence of test development and validation is really something that uh, in order for you to kind of move forward with this change, there's a series of activities that occur just kind of in general for developing and validating um, uh, exam questions like the multiple choice questions that you um, may be considering replacing 
um, from the current use of the MBE. Um, the first step in doing that is confirming your exam blueprint. Um, and so again, if the goal is to simply replicate what the MBE is currently doing, um, that is a fairly quick process. Um, reviewing existing questions, you don't have any uh, questions of your own right now, so there wouldn't be anything uh, of existing questions to review. So one of the, the key first steps would be to develop and review new questions. Now, um, in terms of that, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go into that in a little more detail in a moment. And then from that, um, constructing exam forms, and given the sort of uh, administration modes that you're talking about, whether it is test center, um, remote proctored, or some combination, uh, there will likely need to be multiple forms of the test simply given the volumes, meaning the number of people, the number of applicants who sit for whether it's the February or the July bar exam. Um, then uh, there, you know, the, the step is actually to administer the exams to get data. There is a data analysis process that then occurs um, and then uh, a need to determine a raw passing score because without that MBE, uh, there isn't anything to link the current passing score to a new, uh, a completely new uh, form of that test. And I'll, I'll explain what that um, looks like. The sort of factors that are going to influence um, this process, uh, staff already talked about it, the administration modes, currently event-based in kind of a, a couple of very large kind of conference center environments, uh, remote proctored, testing centers, some combination, and remote proctoring, there's even kind of hybrids of those where you can do them in distributed, uh, you know, distributed environments where uh, maybe you partner with schools, for example, in order to uh, do kind of pseudo event, uh, but still remote proctored where people bring their own device. Um, the capacity to maintain the administration timing. So if you want uh, to to. Uh, retain just the same number of days, like these same two days for everybody, that limits some of the options for administration that you'll have. Um, testing windows, say maybe we are going to be administering over a couple weeks or three weeks, um, that then is part of what influences how many questions you'll need, how many forms of the test that you'll need. And again, some combination of this. Um, and obviously the number of applicants who are sitting for any particular exam, uh, in state or out of state is not that big a deal. Um, the security questions, that was a question I think that was um, raised earlier. Uh, these are it, it, the items, the test questions themselves, in order for them to maintain their validity over time, particularly questions that are used to link from one exam to the next through the equating process, you have to have enough of these and ensure that they are um, uh, essentially representing the, the range of content that's on the test, as well as considering the number of forms, and then something called question exposure, ensuring that uh, questions are not getting leaked uh, or showing up on the internet or being sold or all sorts of different um, nefarious ways that people may try to use uh, to, to get your content to gain an advantage. So as I highlighted earlier, um, developing and reviewing the new questions, this, so Dr. Lovett mentioned a little bit ago, the idea of for licensure and certification tests, content validation is the kind of the key source of evidence that you're using to link content from your examination to the, the job analysis, the practice analysis that occurred uh, within California here a few years ago. The goal for licensure and certification is to link content to practice. And I say content, but it really, when you're uh, developing new questions for this, you still want to have that review and content is inclusive of content and cognitive complexity. But you're also reviewing for fairness considerations that can potentially threaten validity. So we're looking at things like bias. Are we representing diverse conditions? Are we uh, being inclusive in terms of uh, the different sorts of scenarios or examples that we're using um, on the test, as well as are we targeting questions at an appropriate level given the purpose of the test? This is not a test that is used to determine whether or not somebody is expert in particular content areas. 
We are focused specifically on minimally competent or minimally qualified performance at the entry point of licensure. And so that's an important consideration. Now, one of the things that Dr. Lovett said that I think is critically important here, this review would be independent of any vendors that um, that uh, the bar would use to develop the questions. Um, this is very much a trust but verify, right? We don't necessarily trust um, that a vendor by themselves would pr produce something that we would completely sign off on. So having committees of um, newly licensed attorneys, of subject matter experts, review this content and ideally having a separate committee uh, re representing diverse communities, um, uh, gender, ethnicity, uh, rural, urban, socioeconomic status, uh, to review for bias in some of those questions to ensure that if content makes it onto the test, we have signed off on that so that we have every, uh, every confidence that the content that is actually administered to applicants is something that is aligned with expectations for entry-level licensure in California. That independent review that uh, Dr. Lovett mentioned is not only recommended within professional standards for testing, but within the K through 12 space is actually a federal requirement for uh, assessments that are given um, uh, at the state level. So statewide student testing within the federal peer review guidance, independent alignment studies are what they're called. And this is a requirement uh, for you to be able to use this in, in your state. So that is a, a reasonable and, and best practice sort of recommendation for the bar exam as well. Once you have these items, like you have an item pool, or sometimes we call it an item bank, from that, we're going to construct forms of the test and forms of the test that have common sets of uh, questions. And then for future administrations, pretest questions. And I'll explain why. The common sets of questions it is what allows us to statistically connect different forms of the test to one another so that ultimately we can ensure that once a passing score is set, we can equate those. Equating is what you currently use to ensure that the meaning of your passing score stays consistent from February to July, from 2022 to 2023 to 2024 and going forward. Because what you're talking about is essentially creating a brand new test, even if you're replicating something you're currently doing, you are building this from scratch. And as a result, um, you, are, you are setting a new baseline. From that new baseline, the goal is still going to be to continue to build that item bank so that you have additional content to be able to ultimately create new forms of the test in the future. And so that's where those pretest questions come in. For the in initial administration, that wouldn't happen. But for future administrations, you would have questions on the test that are scored and questions on the test that are unscored, which is identical to what is occurring right now with the MBE. In, uh, so that you can collect data from uh, applicants who are motivated to perform and that the statistics that come out of those data are ones that are stable and representative of the target population of, of people who are taking the test, um, which are kind of um, critical elements. So this development and review process uh, that, you know, Cody said like, well, we have every reason to believe that this process is reasonable um, and we can defend it psychometrically these are the sorts of steps um, that the bar would need to go through in order to get to that point of having that confidence of being able to administer new questions um, by, uh, I think, February 2025 is what um, the, the target is. Um, the data analysis then, one of the challenges when you're launching a new test really from scratch is you don't have data on the items. Now, there are strategies uh, for which people will do what are called standalone field tests, where you get uh, you know, groups of people who might be in the target population, administer um, questions to them, and to try to estimate what the statistics would be. Well, the challenge with that is kind of twofold. One, you're exposing those questions now uh, to people who may ultimately see them again on, uh, on the operational test, and two, you're asking them to perform on something for which there is no incentive or motivation for them to perform well. 
So the statistics that come out of those sorts of activities are usually in, unstable at best and sometimes very misleading, often underrepresenting how easy or difficult the questions really are. Meaning the questions may appear to be more difficult than they really are because the, the candidates weren't motivated to perform. Now, another strategy would be we could, at, we could invite a number of first year attorneys to come in and take these questions. Um, once they get over the PTSD from having you know, taken the exam themselves, they may um, also not be that motivated to perform. And worse in that case, that wouldn't be representative of the target population because those would only be people who pass the test and not kind of the full complement of applicants who sit for the test. So there's a number of challenges with trying to get stable data, which is why we rely heavily on that content, like that development and content review process and a kind of bias and fairness review process in advance. Because what we're able to do is we are ultimately able to reserve the right once the test is administered, that if the item does not, or the question does not perform well statistically, we can remove it from scoring so that it, it does not have a negative effect on the applicant. And that's the current practice anyway. If any of the MBE questions right now don't function appropriately, NCBE does not have to use them in scoring. Now, they, they have a long history with the current examination. There's a lot of data on it. Um, those questions have been you know, vetted for a number of years. And so it's very unlikely that those questions would be lost. However, it is possible. And so that, that is something you kind of always reserve as uh, something when you're, you're looking at it. Those multiple choice questions then are, are analyzed or evaluated using a combination of methodologies. One um, is something called item response theory, uh, which is a, uh, it's, a, a, it's a sample independent methodology that tries to um, estimate uh, statistical characteristics for questions in such a way that they are more stable over time than using that second method, classical test theory. The classical test theory approach uh, is sample dependent, meaning it changes depending on the population of people taking it, but it does provide some formative information such as item difficulty, item discrimination, and option analysis where you're looking at how people responded to the questions uh, to help inform future item development or revision. And so we use these methods in combination to basically help build the test and build forms of the test. However, it's not just the multiple choice questions. We also want to ensure that the essay and the, uh, the performance test questions function as, as, as we expect them to. And so we're also looking at reliability um, and validity characteristics of those questions as well. So it's, it's really kind of a whole system. But because of the different question types, we look at different evidence in order to support that. Um, as I mentioned, you're evaluating that technical quality and for the initial baseline administration, uh, because you will not have data on those questions in advance, uh, oftentimes you, you may have a few extra questions on the test to make up for the fact that if you lose some to attrition, you have some that you'll be able to replace um, in that particular form. And that's something, again, at kind of the outset of launch of a program, is one of the um, one of the risks in doing so is because you're you're going into it with every expectation they will function, um, but there is no guarantee, and so you have to be prepared um, to adjust as needed. But with the number of questions that it, that are typically uh, scored on the multiple choice portion, even if you lose five, ten questions on that uh, due to poor statistics, there's more than enough to to still represent the content and also to provide a relatively stable estimate, which is then used in combination with the written portion uh, to form a total score for the candidates. Now, some additional analyses that are done, routinely done as part of kind of psychometric analysis, um, when you have data to be able to do it, is um, uh, differential item functioning, now, this is something Dr. Lovett talked a little bit of, of, about this in um, his presentation, or at least alluded to it. This is a statistical evaluation of whether or not questions potentially exhibit bias. And it's not simply a function of whether there are group differences in performance. 
It is, are there differences in group performance when I control for, uh, for similar abilities? And so um, we, we're using measures within the test in order to estimate uh, people that kind of score within a certain range. And we expect people within a certain range of total scores to then also have similar performance on individual items that then contributed to that total score. And so that um, is, in addition to our front end efforts to review questions for bias, we are, this is now a kind of a back end question to be able to evaluate for bias. Uh, however, if you don't have applicant information to know um, whether or not they are um, members of protected classes that might be used in this analysis for grouping reasons, you can't do that analysis. You have to be able to break that down into group level information in order to conduct those types of analyses. Um, because the bar is considering multiple modes of administration, um, meaning remote proctoring is considered one type of mode, testing center is considered a mode, event-based is considered a mode, um, because those different modes could potentially have uh, different effects on applicants taking the exam, a mode effects study is also often um, conducted in those instances to evaluate whether or not the interpretations we're making on scores are comparable across those different conditions so that we're not seeing that a condition um, had some type of an effect on performance. And again, uh, because we are not randomly assigning people to those conditions, or if, if they're allowed to self-select, that could um, potentially create something systematic. As such, we still need some sort of conditioning or control variable in order to um, estimate whether those mode, whether any differences are um, a, a function of chance or a function of because there's something really there or something really distinct in the conditions under which the uh, uh, applicants took the test. Um, another very common set of analyses that are used in um, uh, credentialing, licensure, and certification programs are forensic analyses that evaluate whether or not um, uh, test questions are functioning appropriately over periods of time. We look at things like item drift. It's a, a, a proxy measure for estimating whether or not that content has been exposed, meaning has it been shared? Has it, you know, have people gained access to it somehow? Um, in violation of confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements. Um, we also look at similarity analysis, which is, um, a, it's more common in event-based situations to estimate whether or not uh, people are potentially copying from one another. And again, these are kind of standard analyses that are, are that are already done in your program, but it's it's, we're highlighting it here just to illustrate, these are the sorts of steps that um, staff and its partners are going through in order to ensure the ongoing validity, reliability, and fairness of the examination. Um, the last couple slides I wanna hit on here are just kind of related to scores themselves. As I mentioned, in creating essentially a new exam, you are establishing a new baseline examination with respect to what we call a raw score. Um, all of us oftentimes think of raw, we probably think largely in the context of raw scores, this is really like the number of points that an applicant earns on whether it's a question or whether it's a form of the examination. It is tied specifically to the specific questions and the form, meaning if one form happens to be a little more difficult than one another, um, uh, the raw scores may not be comparable. So if you get a, a really easy form of the test and I get a really hard form of the test and we both score you know, 60 out of 100 on it, um, those may not uh, be directly comparable unless we know that the tests themselves are similar in ability and we know that you and I as applicants are similar in ability. And so the way that we deal with this is through transformation of those raw scores to a scale score. And whether it's your first year exam, first year exam or the bar exam, you do use scale scores to maintain consistency of what is interpreted as a passing score, as well as interpretability of scores on that scale. And you're able to main, you're, you're using that passing score, the raw path, you're using a raw passing score from a prior examination on which um, it was originally established 
as the anchor point uh, to then scale it back to that passing score. So the passing score represents a fixed location on the scale and the, the, the real or the actual underlying raw cut score or passing score does fluctuate a little bit from exam to exam be because the exam is slightly different each time and the applicants are different each time. And so we don't want um, we don't want this to be normative. And what do I mean by normative? Well, if we're thinking about how we set um, a passing score, which is a process in psychometrics we call standard setting, when there are particular important changes to an exam, one of those being, in this case, replacement of multiple choice items on the test and essentially changing the anchor items that are used for equating for the, for the examination, um, this represents that new baseline. Even though you could consider something called equipercentile equating, which just means what we're saying is if 60% um, of applicants passed the February exam last year, equipercentile would say, if those groups are randomly equivalent, we would expect 60% to pass this year. Now, that sounds reasonable. And if there were not individual applicant consequences for pass or fail, we might use that as sort of a bridge approach. However, because it is normative and predefines that performance, it's not recommended. Because we don't know, we don't know if those um, if that those group of applicants are really almost identical to the to the group that took it previously nor do we know um, uh, characteristics about the test other than what those total scores are. So how do we go about um, establishing a baseline raw passing score, noting that you would not need to make any change uh, to your scale score that can remain again fixed because it's an interpretive scale. Um, there are really kind of three, three ways to do this. One is you can do the study kind of fully prior to the examination. Um, you anchor that in content but because you haven't administered the test yet, you don't necessarily know from a reality check standpoint um, whether or not this is a reasonable expectation for applicants. Uh, you can do such a study completely after the test has been given. So you're looking at content and the applicant um, data combined. That sometimes has the impact of extending the time needed to report scores. And given the amount of time spent, um, uh, by humans scoring the essay and PT questions, uh, applicants and the bar likely do not want to extend that beyond, um, you know, any longer than it needs to be in order to get information back to applicants as accurately and quickly as possible. Um, and so uh, a, a sort of a hybrid of that approach is to have the initial judgments, so have a standard setting group essentially um, make those initial judgments strictly on the content of the examination to then have um, whether that same panel or a policy body then take those recommendations and evaluate it after the exam has been given uh, to look to see whether or not from a reality check standpoint, the data makes sense and the pass rates make sense uh, from a um, reasonableness perspective is something that can occur after administration and likely does not um, uh, have a major effect on reporting time uh, because the the bulk of the work occurs kind of in that first step where committees are are making uh, recommendations um, on the content piece, which can be done essentially while uh, um, essay and PT questions are being scored. So a lot of information, a lot of assumptions. And I guess the only other thing I would stress is um, with this goal of February of 2025 for a new operational examination, that sounds like a long ways away. 11 months is um, not that, that far in the future when it comes to building out a test um, to ensure the, sort of the, the evidence of validity, reliability, fairness that you'll want to have before launching that. And so um, I, I will just stress some of the urgency in... Um, uh, helping staff or supporting staff in being able to make a decision fairly soon so that they can start to implement these sorts of activities uh, to have basically to have greater confidence than in, in what is ultimately delivered. 
Yeah, if you want to take that down, because we could open it up to questions for you and then questions, concerns, just overall reactions to um, this topic altogether. I, I see the uh, San Francisco office has their hands raised. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a couple at a time. So I don't too extensively um, uh, mon monopolize the time. Um, so I think these are quick ones, or these are easy ones. So scaling will be possible uh, because that, that was one of the, in my mind, one of the big functions of the MCBE. Um, and I guess it's possible because our test cohort will be large enough so that we won't hit, if we were say Montana, um, you probably couldn't have a reliable sample um, uh, for scaling purposes just among your, your Montana test takers. And then um, cheating detection will still be built into the the uh, system. Um, am I right in assuming that? Because that, that seemed like another useful feature that the NCBE provided for us. Um, and um, I'll just ask those for now and then I'll come back when others have had a chance to ask. Uh, yes, sir. And so the scaling question, um, absolutely, California has the sort of um, sample size to be able to conduct scaling. On the on the initial launch of the new examination, there will not be equating um, because there's nothing yet to equate to. Once that baseline is established, then equating can be used going forward off of that baseline. But scaling, uh, simply you know, transforming a raw score to a scale score, that um, yes, that can be done. And then I think the second part of your question related to some of the security and forensic analyses. Um, so short answer, yes. Longer answer would be that the types of forensic analyses that are done um, uh, in test center and in um, remote proctor or, or hybrid sorts of environments, there are some um, additional and different methods that would be used beyond what what one might do for kind of an in-person event-based um, sort of analysis that um, uh, may give more evidence of investigation of potential cheating behavior. Um, so it, it wouldn't be identical to what NCBE is currently doing because there are different uh, potential threats um, that you have in those, in the some of the newer modes more so than in the um, event based, but of course, then in the event based, you're you're oftentimes concerned about copying. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll be back. Right. And, and Amy, I I I think I I need to be remind my get brought up to date. What is the NCBE doing? What's their future for multiple choice questions? So um, starting in 2026, uh, they're going to launch the next gen exam, but they have committed to providing the MBE despite that launch, uh, the MBE as they do now, as um, allowing states to procure just that um, component of the uh, of the um, UBE uh, through 2028, February of 2028. So starting in February 2028, we'd have to identify um, an alternative um, for uh, uh, multiple choice questions. So they will no longer provide a uh, uniform multiple choice exam component? Correct. That's not uh, part of the design of the next gen. And my, my, I guess my other thing for you, Amy, is, you know, because I've been ar around with the CBE a while, I have always taken great pride in our, uh, in our EDGE team and, you know, volunteering to work on exam development and then of course all of us attorneys on the cbe work on exam review it is that not the most cost effective way i i always thought it was i mean one taking pride in that we write our own exam questions and they're vetted by the cbe it's just like you know i i always thought that that was such a great thing that we did is that not the most cost effective way to get our exam questions and performance test questions? 
Um, it's not the most cost effective way oh. we're, we're identifying alternatives, but um, the plan is not to uh, release um, the edge team members altogether. We would still um, uh, use them. Uh, we obviously need the edge team for our grading, um, but probably using them to vet the questions in their process as well. So, um, you know, uh, we can, we'll, uh, we have two options right now to continue the essays and the PT the way we have now, which is uh, we develop it in-house and use the edge team as part of our vetting process and our grading. If we identify that um, uh, we need, uh, you know, uh, more questions or a more expedited uh, process of developing um, these questions and we seek a vendor, we would still use the edge team to vet the questions and as part of the grading process. So that part does not go away, Robbie. I don't think, um, uh, in our in our um, exploration, uh, I think there's uh, the, uh, still a reliance on the edge team. Yeah. Thanks, Bethany. Okay. Bethany has a question. Bethany, can, can I be heard from back here, or should yeah, I? Yeah, you can. Hi, Bethany. Okay, great. Um, so I have a, a comment and a question. Um, my comment first is just um, in light that we will be, um, you know, looking at alternatives. I wonder if this might be an opportunity for us to look at more ways to potentially regarding the edge team, diversify our edge team. Um, and while I, I love the edge team, I know they do extremely important work. Um, it is not exactly the most diverse group. And I think that, that is important in regards to just a lot of issues that we've been discussing currently regarding um, you know, diversity and equity and inclusion. And so that's just a comment. But then I wanted to know, I understand the necessity of us evaluating these prior to February, 2028. Um, how or why is February 2025 um, the time frame that we're working off of right now? Because of the projected insolvency of the office. It's back to the primary driver being cost reduction. Um, okay, I'm not clear then. Like why, why wouldn't February 2026 work? The fund, the admissions fund, um, is projected to be insolvent at, by the end of next year. So we need to cut costs um, for next year's administration, both the February and July exams. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Audrey. That's all I was asking. And Larry's got a question here. Yeah. Um, yeah, getting back to the original uh, uh, discussion, you know, there's that old expression when um, you're up to your ass and alligators, it's difficult to remember that the initial objective was to drain the swamp. Um, so we're going broke. And, uh, you know, unless we print money, which is impossible, unless we get an appropriation from the legislature and the governor, which is unlikely, and unless we raise the uh, fee, uh, which is unwise, um, we're going to have to really do some uh, pretty radical, uh, take some radical steps. And so I think we got to go full blast into finding an alternative vendor that will give us the uh, flexibility to uh, decrease our costs and, you know, administer the exam in a way that does that. Um, you know, sooner is better than later. And uh, I have a question also, has there ever been any kind of financial analysis of how much increasing the uh, various um, alternatives to uh, licensure you know, which have been bandied about for the last couple of years, how much it, um, increasing the reliance on that and decreasing the reliance on the bar exam, does that, what kind of impact does that have on uh, admissions finances? Do you mean analyzing if we had another path with a licensure that was not the exam, how that would impact the funds? Right. Um, Right. Well, and when we looked at the portfolio bar exam proposal for uh, the board to then send to the Supreme Court, there was um, a rough estimate of costs in that item. I mean, there would be obviously the, the cost of developing how, how to what, how many work products need to be looked at when someone's doing supervised practice, how, how to grade them, how much that would cost. Um, and then that proposal did. Uh, come with some assessment piece, maybe a performance test or two performance tests. So it wouldn't, it would be a licensure, um, depending on how many uh, applicants go through a licensure path like that, I believe it would be cheaper overall than the way that we are doing the bar exam costs now. So if there's some, I, I think Oregon might be, you know, maybe they would be eventually because they're trying to do these things, they're doing supervised practice and 
bar exam as options for licensure, maybe eventually they would have good data for us on how those costs break out overall. But we, we, you know, it's kind of, um, we don't have all those costs in front of us yet. Can I probe at that? Um, the, uh, the, most of the costs are fixed. The cost of developing the exam questions um, would be the same. The variable costs are the number of people you have to grade. So to the extent that more people don't take the bar exam and take the other path, that means we are going to have fewer people paying for a fixed amount of costs. So I would say the costs are going to go up per applicant. And um, as long as we continue to not recover the full cost of providing the service, if you will, um, we're going to have uh, increased um, negative pressure on our, our, our budget. Um, so I think, yeah, Larry, you, you pointed out a problem, uh, that's with the, um, the alternative approach is now we're running two programs, each have their own costs and we've got fewer people paying for them and not paying the full cost to begin with. So, you know, it's, you're losing money faster that way. Are, are there other Audrey questions? I think Alex is trying to say something. Yeah, Alex I got a question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the current budget, and and how much are we? How much money are we looking to save in the long run? Right. So, and again, I will look for um, maybe our CFO to come speak at the next meeting. But at the board meeting in February, the admissions projected admissions budget um, for twenty twenty four. The revenue was budgeted at 26.9 million and our expenses are 30.7 million. Again, uh, how I started the presentation saying we are at ongoing structural deficit, that's $3.8 million in this year. Got it. Um, and I think one of the slides that Cody has, um, I think it says it saves $2.5 